We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV Online, association with Spine Connect Season Two, to introduce today's program. And the speakers, I hand over to the moderator, Dr. Shailesh Adda. Thank you, Dr. Neeraj uh, Bijlani, Dr. Ashok Sham, and Ortho TV for this wonderful uh, opportunity for all uh, spine orthopedic and neurosurgeons. I welcome you all on behalf of uh, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Pune Orthopedic Society, and Sanjiti Hospital for today's Spine Connect. This is season two, and uh, uh, if you can see that this is a clash of titans today, we have. Uh, all the stalwarts in spine surgery. We have two neurosurgeons today and uh, uh, we have the uh, great academic feast. Uh, I'm sure uh, you all will have a lot of questions. Uh, there is a chat box. You can send your qu queries and we will try to so solve whatever we can today. Uh, to, uh, on behalf of uh, Pune Orthopedic Society and Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, I would like to just uh, enlighten uh, today's uh, agenda. Uh, the plan for today is uh, the first is the confusion that every orthopedic surgeon, spine surgeon is confused when there is a patient who comes to you, maybe a lumbar disc or a cervical disc and whichever academic institution you are trained and uh, how your bosses have taught you, how you liked it, you start doing that way. Maybe an endoscopy or minimally invasive surgery or microscopic or open surgery and uh, there is always going to be a dilemma most of these surgeries are done for betterment of our patient in best of our uh, abilities and capabilities. We have cervical disc replacement uh, versus the ACDF debate, which is ongoing for so many years, and we have uh, a great faculty for this. I would like to start the program from Dr. Ram Chedda, who is going to be the academic chair for this as the president speaks and nobody speaks. So we will have, in case of any uh, controversy, Dr. Ram will be there for us to find, uh, give the final verdict on that. But Ajoy Shetty uh, uh, is uh, going to be the confused person today and person with 20, 30 years of experience in spine. Still he's confused when the disc patient comes, some demanding patient wants a disc replacement, someone wants a fusion, he's still not understanding how he should approach and that's why Ajoy is going to tell us how he is getting confused at 25 years of his experience and in even lumbar disc. A lot of people are talking about minimally invasive discectomy or tubular discectomy, uh, endoscopic discectomy, transforaminal. All these things are going on. The debate is ever ending. And uh, there is always um, minimally invasive versus open or microscopic discectomy. And this is going to be an interesting confusion talk from, uh, and understanding from Dr. Ajoy Shetty. I don't need to introduce Dr. Ajoy. We all know Dr. Ajoy is practicing at Coimbatore as a senior consultant and head at uh, spine department in Ganga Hospital. We welcome you, Ajoy. Uh, I would like to uh, start with uh, Dr. Ram uh, Chedda, sir, who is the ex-president of Spine Surgeons of India, uh, Association of Spine Surgeons of India. And uh, we all know uh, uh, Ram, sir, as a prolific academician, researcher, and clinician and we, we are more than happy for you to be here today giving us good time Ram sir. We welcome you. Uh, our uh, distinguished faculty in cervical debate, uh, I will uh, uh, start with Dr. Samir Dalvi. Uh, I don't need to give any introduction to the man who has reached at a big level in national international circuit uh, because of his uh, great academic and research oriented practice. Dr. Samir is practicing as a head of unit at Hinduja Hospital uh, as a consultant spine surgeon for more than two decades now. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Dalvi, for today's uh, debate. Uh, we have the senior faculty, and this this is the I would like to say is a clash of titans. We have Dr. Samir Dalvi versus Dr. Raj Kumar Deshpande, who is a senior neurosurgeon practicing in Bangalore. And I uh, welcome you, Dr. Deshpande, for today's uh, debate. And Dr. Deshpande is, is a senior spine uh, neurosurgeon and practicing at Bangalore in brain as well as spine surgery practice. He has ex a great experience and uh, he practices minimally invasive as well as maximally invasive surgeries, brain surgeries, tumors, as well as cervical disc replacement. And he has a vast experience of this uh, over uh, the period of two decades. Uh, and Dr. Deshpande will be enlightening us about when to select the patient for cervical disc replacement and what all are the advantages. And that will be an interesting debate to see. Uh, after that debate, we have the lumbar spine, uh, the everlasting uh, saga for orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, when we should consider 
uh, what type of surgery and for this uh, debate we have uh, uh, the faculty from pune orthopedic society dr pramod lokhande who is uh, doing a great work in endoscopic spine surgery all over the world and uh, pramod is known for his endoscopic skills we will be learning uh, a lot from pramod today and uh, uh, this debate will be uh, uh, continued with pramod's uh, next uh, speaker is dr vishal peshatiwar dr vishal is practicing at kokila ben ambani hospital and we know he is a great uh, minimally invasive surgeon of india and he practices uh, extensively minimally invasive surgery and tubular uh, decompression so we will have his view on de decompression discectomy from mis or tubular de uh, decompressions and the last one uh, who is uh, a great neurosurgeon we have dr sushil patkar uh, dr patkar sir is practicing at pune hospital and bharti vidyapeet in uh, pune he is a neurosurgeon who has got more than 2 to 3 decades of experience in spine and brain surgeries we welcome you dr patkar for today's uh, uh, spine connect and he will be talking on open uh, micro or microscopic decompression discectomy which is practiced by most of the surgeons uh, on planet so this will be a very interesting debate we will know their views and uh, everyone is right in their own perspective i think uh, that is uh, okay. where we will get some message and if if ajoy is uh, confused how we should know that who is not confused and dr himanshu kulkarni who is practicing as a spine surgeon in sangli kolapur belt of maharashtra and he is a, a dynamic spine surgeon we will take a lot of uh, pearls from evidence and uh, latest re, uh, literature from dr himanshu kulkarni we welcome you himanshu for today and uh, this this program is a, a great uh, opportunity from uh, maharashtra orthopedic association we have the president of maharashtra orthopedic association dr ajit shinde who is a orthopedic surgeon who has got extensive experience of 30 odd years practicing at sangli and he is not only a orthopedic surgeon but he has got immense interest in spine surgery he practices spine as well so we will uh, uh, have a lot of uh, academic wisdom from sir as well we welcome you dr shinde sir we have dr um, uh, karne narayan karne sir is practicing in pune at uh, two to three centers and he is a senior orthopedic spine surgeon he practices orthopedics extensively but he does spine surgery as well and he is a president of pune orthopedic society and he is a secretary of maharashtra orthopedic association and this is all uh, possible because of all this uh, alliance and uh, we have a lot of viewers watching today's program because of these stalwarts uh, today thank you very much all of you for this great feast and i would like to request dr shinde sir to say a few words and then dr karne sir to give a start up for the program thank you shailesh good evening dear friends i dr ajit shinde president of maharashtra orthopedic association welcome you all to this thought provoking moa pos spine webinar spine connect season 2 today we are dealing with dilemma commonly seen in clinical practice regarding surgical management of cervical and lumbar disc disease friends the burning topic in spine surgery are very widely chosen today to have a fruitful debate discussion amongst masters in field and i hope this will surely bring up certain conclusion and clarity at the end of this meeting today's topics are as mentioned by shailesh one anterior cervical disc fusion versus cervical disc replacement second open surgery versus minimal invasive surgery endoscopic and lumbar in lumbar disc diseases we are fortunate to have stalwarts in the field dr ajay shetty from koimtur dr samir dravi from mumbai dr raj kumar deshpande from bangalore Dr. Peshitti Var from Mumbai and Dr. Suchil Patkar and Dr. Pramod Lokande from Pune, which I am sure will produce a considerable insight in the presenting topic to enlighten orthopedic surgeon practicing every nook and corner of Maharashtra as well as all over India. Dr. Himanshu Kulkarni from Sangli will moderating the today's session. I also thank my close. friend dr ram chadda and dr shailesh hadgaonkar 
for keeping watch on ongoing activities in this webinar season and providing valuable inputs as necessary. Thus, without wasting more time, I, along with Dr. Karne and Dr. Vayagaukar, President and Secretary of POS, hand over the proceeding to Dr. Shailesh. Jai Hind, Jai Maharashtra, Jai POS, Jai Moe. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, kind words. Uh, just uh, a few words from Karne, sir, before we start. Thank, thank you, Shailesh. Uh, on behalf of Pune Orthopedic uh, Society, I welcome all the faculties and uh, also the viewers for this wonderful program. Uh, now, this is the third series in the Spine Connect. First of all, I thank uh, Dr. Pro Professor Ajay Shinde uh, that, uh, to allow us to do this under the aegis of the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association also. And I thank Sancheti Hospital uh, to help for this program. Now, this, this is the third session. The spine is such a uh, place where most of the orthopedic surgeons, they are scared to put their hands into because they feel themselves very much confused. Every year something is coming up. Now, to clear that confusion uh, from the more confused masters, because the, uh, the more master becomes, he sees so many things into that. They have got an academic fist of the who's who in uh, neurosurgery as well as in the orthopedic surgery or the spine surgery uh, for all our delegates. I thank all of them right from Koyimathur to uh, Bangalore and my good friend, Dr. Samuel Dalvi from Mumbai, Dr. Vishal and uh, our bosses from uh, Pune, Dr. Patkar, again, a good friend of mine, our endoscopic doctor, Pramod Lokhande and uh, the upcoming orthopedic surge, uh, spinal surgeon, rapidly upcoming up, Dr. Himanshu Kulkarni. I thank Ortho TV also for uh, a consistent support to Pune Orthopedic Society as well as the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and I welcome all and I wish best for this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karne, sir, for this uh, good start. And uh, without taking much time, I would request uh, Dr. Ajoy to start the show. Over to you, Ajoy. Uh, thank you, Sailesh. I mean, it's a pleasure to be a part of uh, Spine Connect and would like to remember Ketan at this moment. Uh, I mean, as we know, this time we have uh, masters in spine surgery. We have Samir, we have Dr. Raj Kumar, Vishal Pramod, and Dr. Shushil. I mean, to discuss about two of the common tap topics which uh, we operate upon on a day to day basis. And still, there is a dilemma in our mind as to, to what technique to use and when to use and what, is, what would be safe for the patient, for a particular patient. I mean, we have on this side a patient, 29-year-old male, who had a right upper limb radiculopathy for a uh, three months duration, underwent a fusion just with the standalone cage, comfortable at the end of two years. You can see that uh, uh, it is fused well and the patient is happy. Sorry. We have one more patient with a similar scenario. A standalone cage, a good fusion, no major complaints, even though there is a kyphosis in other segments, but patient is apparently normal. And I've always been happy with ACDF for the fact that you can have a variety of implants to choose, even starting from an eyelid crest graft to a standalone cage to a cage with the screws or a cage plate. And in the end of it, uh, it's a relatively simple surgery. The outcome is very, very satisfactory. And most of the time, you do not see the patient uh, after a few months of follow-up, he did not come to you, unlike a back-related issue where he may come back for on and off some degree of pain. Then, they, I also had a patient who, is, who had a early myelopathy, I mean, a myelopathy with a degenerated disc. And I said, as I usually prefer, that I said I would like to do ACDF. But he had gone through the literature and he said, I am too young, I would like to have a disc replacement. And that's what we did. And this is what it end of five years. Patient is fine. Uh, the movement is good and he is comfortable. There is no major issues on the adjacent segment. Therefore, the, I am happy with ACDF, but I always, when I look at a patient with adjacent segment degeneration, which we had operated on, uh, which he had fused, and then the patient comes with the adjacent segment degeneration, or in a scenario when you find that a multiple discs are degenerated, patient is symptomatic to the one side. But however, there is the other disc is also degenerated. Now, I always think that, shall I do a disc replacement 
or what if I do the fusion at C67? Will it accelerate the degeneration at the other level? And especially with the patient with a hard disc, whether to do a total disc replacement or ACDF. And if you go through the literature, TDR is as effective as ACDF. Therefore, that puts a question in my mind. Is it worth the cost? And to give that answer, we have Samit Delvi, who is the chairman of Aospine India. And if you search the net and find out who is the top surgeon in Mumbai, you get Samit's name. On the other hand, we have Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande, who is the president of Minimal Invasive Surgeons of India. And you put in Google and you look at it, the top neurosurgeon, you get his name. And therefore, who else? We have an orthopedic surgeon and we have a, a neurosurgeon to debate as to say which is the better one of them. I think we'll hand over to uh, the speakers to debate about this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you, Ajoy, for that uh, very generous uh, <laughs> um, uh, sort of uh, introduction. And I'm going to jump in straight away if, uh, with the permission. Uh, is it okay, right? I'm supposed to start, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, the question is that cervical arthroplasty for cervical disc. Um, I'm going to say why. And I think Deshpande is going to say why not rather than anything else. Um, so the question is for a one level cervical disc, do we fuse? Or do we just confuse everybody? That is the question. ACDF, now in spine, those of you who are spine surgeons, I think the biggest, most frustrating thing about spine surgery is that the results are not 100%. Patients keep coming back with one or the other complaints. And, uh, you know, we are just frustrated with all of that. Now, ACDF is the one surgery in spine, which is predictable and the best result. As uh, Ajoy pointed out, these patients don't come back. They're the happiest patients. I have yet to see an unhappy ACDF patient in my entire career. And other lumbar spine patients keep coming back. Why should we mess with this surgery, which is the best surgery ever? So if you have patients coming like this and you do decide to do an ACDF for them and uh, you, uh, rather an anterior surgery for them, you can see there's signal change, there's degenerative disc, there is disc out. It's a hard disc, which is quite, uh, you know, come out all the way. And uh, the way out, the gold standard operation for this is uh, this. And there's a reason why it is called gold standard. Uh, these patients are like, so this is uh, two or three years down the line, but even clinically, they don't come back. When we call them back, even at 10 years, they are happy. Uh, the reason of a gold standard, gold standard means this is the standard against which anything has to be uh, measured. So what was the people's problem with the ACDF? And I put an inverted comma with people's because actually 15 years ago, nobody had a problem. I mean, I don't think any of the senior surgeons felt they're doing anything wrong when they're doing an ACDF or there were any regrets with ACDF. Mm -hmm. Who are the people? Surgeons had no problem. As I said, surgeons were happy. I don't think anybody regretted. The industry had a problem, but not enough money. Because some neurosurgeons were doing simple discectomies. Some orthopedic surgeons were doing only uh, iliac crests. And then the cages, etc. they cost 10, 15,000 rupees. You know, industry is all about trying to make more money. And hence the boogie was raised. And what was the boogie? What was, what was raised? There were two boogies. One was movement or the lack of it, meaning that fusion restricts movement. And the other thing, which is the biggest boogie of all, or the only one really, is the adjacent level. So everybody started talking about adjacent level, or rather the industry or the researchers started to get people to talk about adjacent level. Now let's look at movement as the first thing. The question is how much movement is actually preserved as opposed to a fusion in a cervical disease. If you do a one-level ACDF, I have not seen any patient with restricted range of movements. And any of you, uh, I mean, maybe that should have been my last slide, but any of you who are fans of Hindi movies and have seen uh, Shah Rukh Khan jumping and dancing around, he's around 15 years post ACDF. I don't think, you know, I, I wish he would stop moving because then we get other nice movie stars, but he's moving as much as you can. How long does that movement stay is the next issue. I mean, of course, I, I, uh, I'm very impressed with um, Ajoy's X-ray, which at four years showed movements. Mm -hmm. But uh, most in the literature, if you see, and even in experience, yeah, movement yeah, 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 is yeah, yeah, yeah. moving after three to four years. Yeah, yeah. Can others please uh, mute? Yeah. And the other question is, of what use is that movement when you're having a proper full survival okay. flexion, extension, and rotation? Yeah. Yeah. Shinde, can you uh, mute your microscope? Yeah. Your, mute yourself, please. Yeah. Shinde sir, zara, um, hai bandha kara. Nah. question is of what use is that movement? There is no use of that movement. So how much movement is actually preserved? It's a few degrees at best. And by no means does it reproduce all the functions. You just get a flexion extension x-ray showing a few degrees of movement, which is what uh, Ajoy showed us. 
and what about all the other movements there is lateral there is gliding there is shock absorption there are so many movements it's not that easy and the question is how long does it stay and most studies show that disc stop moving at 2 to 4 years and then it just remains as an expensive cage or an expensive fusion device and this is uh, a case and this is my own case and uh, you know it has there is no movement whatsoever at the disc so the question is of what use is that movement there are million of acdf patients who lead completely normal lives without any restriction of movement sharukh khan and many others uh, in that group and there are many patients who are born with congenital fusions who really don't have any problems at all they are born with a fusion maybe at the age of 40 or 45 they get an adjacent level but at the age of 40 or 45 means it's been 40 to 45 years of that block vertebra so if you're operating on somebody who's 40 to do a disc replacement for him doesn't make any sense let's talk about adjacent level now this adjacent level is the big boogie or the big guy who has been raised the question is truly what is actually the incidence in any case and these studies are very vague because they don't talk about uh, uh, they don't really talk about what i'll come to later which is symptomatic right so the question is what is the incidence in any case uh, what what do i mean by that that if somebody has degenerative disc at c4 c56 uh, uh, he is going to get degenerative disc at the other level as well right it's not that if you get right knee arthritis you're going to get left knee arthritis if you do a right tkr you can't say that the left knee is a adjacent knee disease no he's going to get degenerated anyway what is the incidence after fusion is the question and what is the incidence after adr because you need to say that after adr there is no if you tell me that after adr there is no uh, adjacent level i may still agree but that is also not true there is an incidence the next is how many of these are actually symptomatic and how many require revision so the question is what is the incidence of symptomatic adjacent level which needs surgery which would have been prevented if the best cervical because cervical discrectomy replacement is very technically uh, sensitive which would have been prevented if the best cervical disc perf uh, was performed at the index level now here if you tell me that there are 1000 patients every year in the city of mumbai and in the city of uh, bangalore who are coming back with this i would say okay we are justified in doing this operation but that is not true how many of them come back what about the long term results now in anything you have to talk about long term results the long term results of acdf are known it's been done since 40 years there is nobody who can catch me about the long term result of acdf what about the um, uh, acdrs the real follow up is not available and i'll tell you why it is because prosthetic designs and materials keep changing once you get one you will have of the you know one of the pro, like prodisc c prodisc c has already gone out and the next one has come in by the time you get the result of this then the next one has come in so they keep shifting the goal post they keep making minor changes and you do not there is no single prosthesis on which like for me to tell a patient who comes to me at the age of 35 to say that i have a 35 year old result on this operation which i'm going to do for you i cannot honestly tell that to the patient i can only say that okay this is five years result that's it what about complications now the surgery is the same up to a point right we do a anterior cervical exposure we do a discectomy we do a decompression and then the end plates are ready now every step in an operation has its own set of complications and potential complications till this point the number of complications are the same after this point if you do a fusion you put in a bone graft and you put in your uh, uh, you know your cage or whatever you want i don't put in a plate so that plate related complications are out i just put in a stand alone cage there is very little complication after that i mean a cervical fusion is an almost guaranteed operation cervical fusion is so good that most of the cervical disc replacements also fuse it is that good so no more complications but if you put in a cervical prosthesis you have a whole set of complications which are going to arise because of that because you open to a set of known as well as unknown complications implant migration implant breakage subsidence where local reaction and tissue reactions i have had a patient who because of the keel got a neurological deficit because the keel broke off and we don't even know about the long term issues as to what this is going to do so you are, you are you know you are just adding a whole bunch of new complications to a simple procedure which is result oriented and uh, the main the most important issue is that a cervical disc replacement is technically really difficult i mean kudos to maybe dr deshpande if he does it and dr shetty uh, who seems to be a, but it is very unforgiving to technical uh, issues so slightly malplaced slightly angle is different a little more end plate removed and that surgery is going to fail so i mean 
you know, I, I think that that it is very important because any surgery has to be reproducible. Whereas in an ACDF, if you do a little left, little right, little up, little down, nothing happens. It fuses. The cervical spine fuses. What about cost? I think this is a, this is a no-brainer because if you do an unfused discectomy, which also works, it's free. If you put in the bone graft, it is almost free. A cage or a plate starting from fifteen thousand for an Indian to thirty-five thousand for an imported. Whereas your ADR costs one to one and a half lakhs. I mean, of course, there are people who can afford it. I'm not denying it, and there are people who are insured as well. So there is no denial of that. But yes, there is a cost to it. What about intuitive implant design? So let me tell you this: whenever you are selling, whenever the industry sells this procedure to somebody, a surgeon, a spine surgeon, a neurosurgeon, they put it in their mind that okay, we need to, and it is intuitive that you are removing a disc, so we must replace it. It is intuitive. But the question is. that are you replacing it with something which is actually working like what is there in the first place see hips and knees like you cannot compare this a hip or a knee is a you, you they are uniaxial joints they are even still the tkr design is not 100% perfect but at least it's close to it the spine is very complex a spinal segment because it it has the disc it has the facet joints behind it has the ligaments right in that the disc itself is very complex it's got annulus fibrosus nucleus pulposus the movements are gliding the movements are uh, shock absorbing and they are not reproducible by any of the um, uh, pre present designs where you're just putting two place so it's a very simplistic thought that you're replacing anything by doing that you're not replacing the spinal segment at all in fact the first disc which is the brian disc at least had some point of shock absorption but these new ones don't have any such uh, thing they are just plates which slide over each other so there is no disc design which comes even close to nature today what about the literature so let me tell you one thing i have tried to read the literature now and recent papers and meta analysis do seem to equate or favor slightly acdr but honestly i don't think they are relevant in an individual case i don't know what are the parameters which they have seen and literature and surgeons have a huge bias in the newer papers for a whole number of reasons because they study these things and the old ones so nobody publishes there is no uh, you know controlled randomized trial which has shown that uh, acdr is any better so the question to ask that is there enough reason to subject a patient to a procedure at a high cost whose use you cannot defend and which may land the patient with a complication or revision situation when you have a time tested alternative which is cheap and has excellent and predictable results this is a question i'm not even talking about the extra 45 minutes and stress which is added to the operation right that aside just this is enough of your thought so in my experience in 22 years of private practice i'm not talking about my km years i have seen maybe five adjacent levels needing surgery maybe all of them were a good eight years after the index and the question the million dollar question is that if these patients would have had an acdr would it have pre would it have prevented it or would it have uh, had an adjacent level anyway because then they will say that oh five anyway it's like all these people who are getting covid even after the vaccine they're saying oh still you know some people still get it comes to the same thing like i would happily do an acdr if no patient got an adjacent level but i am not going to do an acdr when anyway these four or five people are getting which they may have got even so i am not going to do 500 or 1000 needless operations to save maybe a few patients from an adjacent level which you are not even sure whether it was caused by the fusion or not so finally in my practice there's another another completely different reason here why why i am not in favor of acdr in my practice the incidence of anterior surgery for soft disc herniation is anyway plummeted firstly more than 90% get better with conservative and that i knew since day 1 i i would rarely operate on cervical radiculopathy the remaining i treat now with posterior microendoscopic foramen anatomy and discectomy and the hard discs and the myelopathies which require a lot of bone removal they are not suitable for replacement so i mean uh, again let me get back to ajoy shetty's case it was a beautiful case but i would not have done a disc replacement for that if the patient came to me and said dr rajkumar wants to do a disc replacement i would have said go but in this case of course ajay has done a good job and the movement is there the point is when you have a disc like this which has osteophytes all around which you are removing the chances are very high that it will fuse so uh, but anyway he has uh, in that case has been a sort of an outlier for that so i am not getting an indication to do a cervical disc replacement so i'll tell you who i will have a cervical disc replacement i will do in a young patient who has lot of money or a large medical claim who has a cervical disc herniation which is central and one side which i can't get at from the back who has not responded to conservative surgery 
and who has already already consulted with Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande and convinced for a cervical disc replacement. He is the only character who I would do an anterior cervical disc replacement with. So that's my only indication for this procedure, nothing else. And to him also, honestly, I cannot tell him that I'm doing this operation for you at the age of 30, and I don't know what's going to happen to you later on. My best, my best promise in this case would be my best hope is that if he fuses good, sala fuse ho jayega, kach kach nahi aage, rather than he land up with a complication. So I do these tubular. I think we all know these now, posterior foramenotomies, and they are very good for uh, doing this. So therefore, there is very little scope or indication or justification for ACDR in my kind of rational, evidence-based, ethical, and cost-effective practice. So when you look at all the things together, I'm not really seeing any role for a disc placement. Uh, thank you very much. And there is no audience to clap, so I just clap for myself. <laughs> Excellent uh, presentation and uh, to the T, I can say, Dr. Dalvi, uh, this, this, as I said, it, this is a clash of titans and uh, in this galaxy of stars, you pointed out reasons for why we should choose ACDF only. And uh, let's see uh, our other superstar, Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande, what he has to say for the CDR, the cervical disc replacement, which is still done in a lot of centers in the world and they still believe the uh, uh, disc replacement as a primary treatment for cervical disc. Over to you, sir. I'll share my screen. Yes, please. First, let me thank Shailesh for this opportunity for me to present my points for CDR. And of course, uh, I'm seeing some uh, great points from uh, Samir and I have to somehow counter it. But before I do that, I will uh, have pay my respects to all the seniors in the audience and all my friends, great friends. And I see Ram there, Ajay, everybody. So without much ado, let me start. This is the debate ACDR versus CDR. And for ACDF, uh, uh, our great man Samir has really, really hit my complete over for multiple force. So I'm a little worried guy now. So anyway, let me try something. And as Ajay said, I remember Ketan, great guy, good friend. In a very short while that I briefly knew him. So let's start with this particular case. 59 years male with myelopathy had two fusions done, one above and one below the offending disc now. So what? But the disc is now creating a problem. You, you fuse this, you'll end up with the whole of the cervical spine being fused. So there's a dilemma. So let me see this. Do you know what this is? This is a nail in a tire. Why is this coming in a cervical disc debate? very important and relevant to think about this. There's a nail in a tire. In the earlier days, this was being done. First, you take out the tube, you patch it up, check again, then deflate, then you put it again and hope for the best. And it was cheap, it was economical, it was great. There was 50 years story behind it. No problem. Just like ACDF, not a problem at all. But now you have a situation where in a radial tire, you don't have to take the tire out. You can push the healing rubber inside and then you don't have, have any problem. So you have this tube and tubeless tire, advantages, disadvantages. One is saying silicone, other saying that, you know, a whole lot of things. This is what happens to a tube tire, ACDF. So Samir is a well-known spine surgeon. He's very accomplished. My great friend. He is given convincing evidence. His personal as well as other kind of statistics. And as Shaila said, he's a big level international national surgeon. So he, I've taken the slide from Samir. If you see the set of complications, they are all the complications for ACDF. Everything. So I will quote Benjamin Disraeli, lies, damn lies, and statistics. 
and not personal to some here, but this is a debate. So the big debate is, is it a tubeless tire or is it a tube tire? Now, if you look at the tubeless tire, the cost is higher, but safety is better. Whereas in the tube, if the cost is less, but you have high maintenance. So Samir said, boogie, boogie, boogie. I call him the boogie man now. So important consideration, forgetting personalities, it's important to consider the signs behind an action. If a motion is getting lost at a particular level, our job is to preserve it. At this point in time, it may not be a perfect way, but that's the only way. So why motion preservation is important? You know, there are so many stories of failure of fusion, malfusion, adjacent segment degeneration. There's enough clinical evidence for that. Now, from the first cervical prosthesis, which was just a ball, to the bristol joint in 98 and subsequently to many, many varieties, it is an evolution in progress. So when things are getting evolved and finally a kind of a stable situation is achieved, you will have these uncertainties, but there's nothing wrong with the principle. So the main things that differentiate a disc arthroplasty from a fusion is the absence of pseudoarthrosis, the bone graft is not there, but instrumentation, exposure, post-operative immunization are all similar, but you have the added benefit of shock absorption. You can have very early return to activities. And there are so many qualities of ideal cervical prosthesis. I told you, this is still the work in progress. Just for some people who would like to know what is the center of rotation, which is defined as fixed if the center of rotation doesn't move in flexion and extension. Okay, whereas in a coupled motion, the center of rotation tends to move forwards and backwards, like in the cervical spine. You see the green dot keeps moving backwards in extension. So this is the way you have to decide a cervical arthroplasty device. There are a lot of studies where biomechanical advantages of ADS are there. For classification, we can say unconstrained, semi-constrained, constrained, like anywhere else. And you can see a series of discs that are available. Samir is right. There are so many varieties. How do you choose? When to choose? That's a separate topic, but there are options available. So there is no ideal prosthesis. There are no comparative studies, agreeable, but it's a work in progress. There are fantastic materials used, combination of titanium, cobalt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which have got great strength, hardness, corrosion res resistance. So take an example like this. The patient has many years down the line, excellent movement, two level, below, I have written the range of movement, persisting 78 degrees, which is normal, many, many years. 36 year old horse rider, very, very, very young person, multi-level disc disease. Imagine if you were to fuse this, my God, by the time this patient is 70, you will have a stiff neck, cannot even turn, multi-level. And all these are working beautifully. This is a three level cervical disc arthroplasty, very, very effective. About five, six years down the line, the person is still continuing to drive, you know, uh, ride horses, doing very fine. So what about special situations like I showed in the initial slide where there is adjacent segment disease due to your spine fusion? So we did our own studies and you know, it's important just to remember that here the range of motion, okay? improved significantly in the post-operative phase and it remained significant for a long time. We have measured this, all these things, pre-operative, post-operative, range of movement. So I can go on and show many, many cases, including the latest one where in this 50 year old man who had two level disc disease, we ended up doing two level disc replacement and is doing excellent. 
And one of the fears that people have is if they have a fall in the process, in the time when they're recovering from an ADR, the disc may dislodge. This patient had a significant fall and uh, within a month after surgery, he slipped and fell. Luckily, everything looks good. So I think it's a very stable construct. We have done good studies. Now, what is this again, tire business? You know, science doesn't stop at one thing and say everything is hunky-dory. I'm not going to go further. So you have tube tires, tubeless, but still there is puncture. Still there is problem. So look at this new concept. It is airless. It is rechargeable. It's connected, sustainable. Do you know it's going to happen? Just imagine the design change. Yes, this is a new design. Yes, nobody has tested perfectly. This is not the only design, new designs will come. A nail can go in, but there's no puncture. You can continue to ride. It is rechargeable. And you know what it means? After say 5,000 kilometers, you attach it to a 3D printer on demand, it will put back the rubber again. Imagine some things like that happening in the cervical disc, 100% sustainable, you're not destroying nature. So my concept would be in future, you'll have a 3D printed artificial cervical disc for that patient, size, angulation, everything done. And you apply to minimally invasive surgery, mm -hmm. possibly as a decade procedure. And materials will have excellent longevity with the least debris. And that I personally feel is the way forward. You can always hang on to the ACDF, not a problem. As Samir said, I do ACDF. Sorry, I do ACDFs, I do CDRs. I think any new thing should be thoughtfully uh, gone through, should discuss with the family and the patient. You should develop a surgical skill for that and then apply that knowledge on specific indications. Then you'll have a great result. Thank you so much. I think we had an excellent debate between uh, two of our stalwarts, each uh, bitterly trying to show a procedure as something beyond the other. The debate has been fantastic. They're both excellent speakers and they're brilliant surgeons. But one thing which it has left both Ajoy and me and probably most of us is more confused. Now, as we look at it today, we must understand that the proof of the pudding in both the procedures is the decompression. And both would agree that the patient relief immediately post-op is the decompression, which as Samir said, he does it from the rear today. And probably Dr. Deshpande would also agree that if he was to do even a microscopic decompression from the front or a Joe's procedure as a lot of neurosurgeons practice without doing much of the disc devastation, you could end up with a similar good result in a radiculopathy patient. However, when we look at the long term, Actually, both are right in their own way. One is a Toyota, the other is a Mercedes. And we have goods and very goods associated with both the procedures. As I look at it, I feel the initial training will be with the fusion. A fusion will probably be a generalized option that you could have across age groups and would be a primary good result surgery. As disc replacement further evolves, gets its finesse, and as uh, explored by Dr. Deshpande into the near future, if it becomes patient specific and takes care of all the complications which Samir has feared, maybe at that stage, it would then probably be less expensive and hence that cost factor would have also been taken care of and would be a good physiological replacement. What I mean is maintaining the function. Again, as we stand today, as rightly mentioned by both, the literature is at par. The jury is not yet out. Samir may have found literature supporting ACDR, but 
I do agree there's a lot of literature supporting fusion as well, and we still do a lot of fusions. So today we have not yet evolved, but the future is to get physiological options. Maybe a non-surgical option will come in, a less invasive option will come in, an implantable percutaneous procedure may come in, which may be the future. So this is where I am. As I look at it, I put some more food for thought, and I would like Samir to have a rebuttal now, based on what Dr. Deshpande has alleged him as a boogeyman. So Samir. I have Deshpande waiting for you, and you have now a chance, two minutes, to give Dr. Deshpande whatever he has sort of given to you in the last 10 to 12. All yours, Samir. Thank you very much. I think uh, for starters, I would like to say, I would like to compliment uh, Dr. Deshpande. Truly an excellent talk, and especially his cases have really been impressive, and there is no doubt uh, that uh, his cases have been good. What he has shown, there is really no argument with that. However, uh, I think the most important, the, the one word or one phrase which he used again and again in his uh, talk was work in progress. And work in progress and number of choices in the prosthesis means that there is no result, there is uh, no long term result, there is no surety, etc. Whereas the ACDF is not a work in progress. Now, today, that I sit, Sorry to say, or even when Dr. Deshpande sits, as a matter of fact, a patient comes to me with a particular expectation. They expect to be treated with uh, something which is result oriented. And for me, it is that one patient who matters. It doesn't matter. The whole statistic doesn't matter. If I was chairman of a spine institute in Russia or China, where every day I'm doing 100 surgeries, you know, on, on the cervical spine, which happens in these countries, then it's fair enough that you want to try. And yes, you want to improve. I am not denying ACDF is definitely not an ideal situation because you are not respecting uh, physiology or biomechanics. I agree to it. I am just saying that the ACDR is not the answer to it. It is not working today. I don't think it works today and therefore I am not willing to do it for an individual patient and for me each individual patient is what matters and each individual patient is from whom I want to get the result. So my question is for me, if I were to operate on myself or my relative, would I do an ACDR? Absolutely not. Would I send him to Rajkumar Deshpande for an ACDR? 100% no, because Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande is more interested in tires. So I have a feeling at 10 o'clock, he has a webinar with Apollo Tires, where he's going to tell them about how ACDR is, uh, ACDF is becoming ACDR and therefore we must need newer tires. So that is very important. <laughs> Luckily, these tires can be changed and we can keep on buying new cars every two to three years, but all of us have only one body and one neck. So, while, while God has not given us a chance to have new bodies and there is no rebirth, I will still stick to ACDF as my treatment of choice. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dalp, will you prefer a tubeless tire or a tad, the tire which he presented the previous one? I will, I will have a tire, see, because these are all evidence-based, the tubeless tire today. So obviously my BMW has tubeless tires, but tubeless tires have been around for 30 years. They have not been invented yesterday. The other thing is that they have been tested by BMW or by Michelin. They have been tested for millions of miles on their machines and uh, simulators. It is not that somebody, suppose somebody invents a new tire and tells me to use it tomorrow, I won't use it. And last but not the least, I can always change the tire and buy a new car, but I can't buy a new body for myself if something goes wrong. So I cannot compare tires with, I cannot no, compare no, no, tires. That was, that was a nice one which he has shown that a tire with a tube and a tubeless tire. So that you have a tubeless tire. Okay, good. Thank you, Samir. That was great. Uh, Dr. Deshpande, uh, are you going to retire after this or are you having something to rebuttal the BMW tires? Yes. Uh, you are muted, sir. Dr. Deshpande, please unmute, sir. Please unmute, please unmute, yeah. Is it okay now? Thanks. Yeah. First of all, let me uh, congratulate Samir on his wonderful talk. And I have a great respect for his work. I have nothing uh, against his work. The, the idea is, the, the idea of showing a, a tire is to make a person understand conceptually that something has to be taught in your mind to change the process of getting stuck in a rut. That's number one. The second thing that I want to introduce here is 
all new things are not bad. That doesn't mean you should try all new things. I hope that this is very clear. I think the word that I would like to use is a judicious use. What in my practice, I tell my young colleagues, surgical balance. You don't use everything on every patient. That's not the way you should think. I think given the right conditions, uh, every surgical technique and every implant will be optimally uh, performing if it is used judiciously. This is what I want to convey. First, change the concept. Second, learn the technique. Third, use it uh, very judiciously. Then you're likely to get a good result. I think we should forget the era of one size fits all. Patient specific therapies are coming, whether it is brain tumor surgery, lumbar disc, or spinal cord stimulation. Uh, it has to be tailored. Our concept and our thinking has to change. That's my uh, response to Samir. Sir, should we get an additional opinion of our senior neurosurgeon, Dr. Patkar, sir, on this? Just his views. So you are muted. You are muted. Kushil, you are muted. Am I am I audible now? Yes, yes. Nice to see all you guys. Nice to see Ram after so many years. Uh, we go back many, many years from Sion Hospital. I'm very happy to hear his voice. And uh, he's going to tease me next and next when I start presenting. But when it comes to cervical fusions, I think uh, this boogie of adjacent level, this did I completely agree with Samir that this, the original Hillebrand's article from, uh, I think, Finland or Norway, I don't remember, one of these countries, was just a comparison and study of 15 cases where he came out with this idea of adjacent level disc degeneration. I think adjacent level disc degeneration is a, a boogie created uh, by the industry. And I feel that the success of cervical fusion is also depending on the gardening that is done at the time of the surgery. Maintaining the lordosis, maintaining the correct uh, curvature of the spine, these are very important than just trying to get a fusion. And they are very important in not getting an adjacent level dis degeneration. So I think, um, uh, see, lumbar dis uh, replacement uh, was born, tied a premature death, and has been buried. The lumbar disc, I was with Chungkun Park where we formed a society of lumbar disc replacement, and now it is already inside the grave. Cervical disc replacement, I feel, is you know already reaching somewhere to enter into the ICU and will soon die in some better technology. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's Dr. Patkar. And let's hear from Vishal, uh, patient Tivar, who does a lot of advanced work. Yes, Vishal. Uh, so I agree, ACDF is, has stood the uh, test of time for decades, probably a century in a couple of uh, more years. But uh, like Dr. Deshpande said, uh, we have to have progress, not just for the sake of it, but because uh, we can't be... Uh, Science is about refining what you're doing. Uh, probably we don't have an ideal uh, disc replacement processes yet. But having said it, uh, it's not that the ACDF uh, implants or even the simple bone graft, as most of us used to put it in our training, has uh, does not have its problem. Uh, probably design failures have led and a lack of understanding of the biomechanics is where uh, the and replacement still fails. Having said it, uh, newer discs do have better data. And like Samir said, Michelin tested uh, their tires. Uh, I believe most uh, implant manufacturers do have a biomechanics testing where they check for a number of million cycles that a disc goes through. That is probably how much a disc would move in their lifetime. So the answer is somewhere in between. You cannot be very rigid that I will do only a fusion because yes, replacements have their uh, 
uh, indications too. But then there cannot be the other extreme that I will do all replacements because obviously in osteophytic condition, uh, it's not something that works. Uh, hybrids, uh, we've seen a lot of hybrids that uh, Professor Wong used to do in Singapore when I was in training. And uh, he has recently put up his uh, nearly 20 year data of uh, movement and quite a few of his discs are still mobile. And even if it buys you five to six years of mobility, that's that much late uh, fusion at that level. And that's my take. I think somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I would like to ask Pramod uh, Lokande his take on this cervical. Well, actually, I agree with both uh, Dr. Samir and Dr. Uh, Rajkumar Deshpande. First of all, you know, uh, uh, ACDF has been time tested. It has always been there. And I don't think there are any complications. It is a time proven surgery. But we have to move ahead. We have to incorporate technology. Uh, but the problem with this technology right now, it is still it is in its infancy. It is not well developed, and the actual indications uh, which are uh, you know uh, uh, which are recommended for artificial disc replacement, they probably you know whenever an Indian patient comes to you, he's probably passed that indication. They all uh, usually Indian patients they usually come very late to you, and usually they have some kind of arthritis, some you know uh, problems. So these are not the right or correct indications for uh, artificial disc replacements. So definitely we have to look, look for the technology, but it, the technology has to improve, it has to grow. And ultimately I think it will be incorporated in future, but pro probably I think right now it has got very limited indications. Yeah, I'm done. Nilesh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I have some experience uh, when I was in England and uh, Dr. Thai Frizam was the inventor of Maverick used to do a lot of cervical disc replacements and that time we have had a great uh, exposure and what I have realized it has a specific indication. We have done Maverick, uh, all different types of new necks and uh, Discover, Discoserve, uh, Prestige, all of them we used to do two level, three level, and uh, we have we have presented our uh, series in the Spine Arthroplasty Society that time. And uh, it, the indications, if you select wisely, the disc replacement will uh, stay here with uh, de redefining it o its own uh, components, and uh, maybe the future, as Dr. Ram was saying, it's de definitely a biological. Uh, requirement of the body where we need the disc to be out and something which gives a natural motion. As we all know, ACDF is time tested and it really gives wonderful results. This debate is uh, wonderfully done uh, by Dr. Deshpande uh, and Dr. Dalvi. Uh, I think uh, it's the indication which is very, very important when you select the case in cervical disc. Over to you uh, for the final words on this debate, Dr. Ram, sir. Thank you very much, Shailesh. Uh, without much ado, I would just quote two things that I've read. One is Samuel Beckett who said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. So please remember that. And Albert Einstein, who's regarded as probably the biggest genius of this generation or couple of generations, he modified his theory of relativity for which he's known seven times, which means he failed seven times before he succeeded in sharing the theory of relativity with us. So please understand that success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue which matters. So Dr. Deshpande does have the courage to continue. And I believe someday we'll have a physiological option for the way forward. Thank you, Shailesh. Over to you. Thank you all. Uh, and uh, Thank you very so much. Thank you very much. And again, uh, Dr. Uh, as I said, Dr. Uh, Deshpande, Great talk, great debate. I really enjoyed it. And I hope my personal comments were taken in the spirit of a joking because on a Saturday evening, I think some humor has to be introduced into the talks. Samir, no offense taken. Nothing, you, nothing. Don't worry. I'm cool. Don't worry. It's a Saturday evening, we, we, we should be sitting with beers actually. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Thank Excellent. You, guys. And uh, we move on to the next debate. And this is the debate which a lot of orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons are waiting for. The second debate on the most common scenario in everyone's practice, the lumbar disc. And, uh, you know, okay, there are various things we all see at each conference. Anywhere in the world you go, this debate is getting more tastier and more interesting by the day as uh, there is a lot of evolution happening. We have three... Uh, 
musketeers for this uh, Dr. Uh, Vishal Peshettiwar to start with on his MIS, Dr. Pramod Lokande, uh, who is heading the department at uh, SKN Medical College and uh, Jahangir Hospital uh, for endoscopic spine and uh, Dr. Sushil Patkar, the, the legend in spine and neurosurgery for standard microscopic open discectomy. Over to you, Vishal, for the next debate. And uh, sorry for this. Uh, I would like Dr. Ajoy to, uh, because yeah, okay. Dr. Ajoy to have the confusion okay. because that we have only cervical. Uh, I would request Dr. Ajoy to share his thoughts on his confusion. Over to you, Ajoy. Uh, sorry, wrong one. One second, please. Sorry. Tell As it, we were, yeah. No, no, I think it's the wrong one. Just no. once again. Tell yeah. it to Eman should speak later. Yeah, yeah, after the debate, he has uh, complete uh, in one go. Okay. okay. Uh, now, coming to the debate, I mean, the first debate was really excellent. I would say that Samir, as usual, is a great speaker and he had, uh, there was no issues for him. But uh, I was quite surprisingly impressed by Dr. Rajkumar's defense. I mean, it, actually, it was spot on. And now we'd go further with the other common thing. I mean, uh, a base case scenario of a lumbar disc prolapse, a 24 year old. And uh, right now we have three options. You can do a microdiscectomy, tubular, and endoscopic. And as usual, we choose a microdiscectomy. Similarly, in a patient with a L5S1 disc. Therefore, uh, but this is what we have been using it for a long time. We have been doing microdiscectomy for more than 20 years, and the results have been satisfactory. But however, we do know that when you do a microdiscectomy, things are not always very rosy. I mean, uh, we had situations wherein the patient who underwent a microdiscectomy had a discitis and then went on to have a repeated debridement. He went on to have a fusion, but then infection still persisted. He needed a revision, a bigger diameter screws, VAC application, and then eventually went on to heal. But over a period of uh, multiple surgeries, I think that patient had around six to eight surgeries, but in the end it eventually fused. But he had to go through a, a huge process and he was from Ireland, an Indian who was living in Ireland, he was supposed to go back, the whole thing got changed. Therefore, I always used to think, I mean, and especially uh, we used to think that if you do a minimal access surgery, does the infection come down? Therefore, is there an added benefit? Uh, we, the options of doing a tubular, I was not very much convinced about tubular, mainly because of the fact it's almost, especially for a microdiscectomy, it doesn't make much of a sense. The only difference is it's a transfacial, whereas in a microdiscectomy, traditionally, we elevate the fascia from the midline. But if you take a U-shaped flap, then again, it becomes transfacial, when you are doing a micro uh, But when you look at the literature, there is no major difference between those two, but endoscopic seems to be better than a tubular. Therefore, I decided to go on to do an endoscopy. I would like to thank Pramod for uh, training us to a large extent, to on all extent, to do a micro endoscopic. We started doing endoscopic discectomy. Had been good. We have done about 50 so far, no good satisfaction. But then, you see a situation like this where the patient comes back with the recurrence. MRI doesn't show anything much, but the patient was very symptomatic. We went in, he had a recurrent disc. Therefore, now I'm confused about which discectomy to choose. Is it worth to switch from a micro discectomy to learn something new at this age or to stick to a micro discectomy? And we have three stalwarts. I mean, nobody needs an introduction. Vishal, Pramod, and Dr. Sushil to talk to us to say which they believe is the best and probably uh, whether we should move on from a micro discectomy to something else or to stick to micro discectomy. Over to you, Vishal. We are really confused now, Ajoy. Can you see my screen there? 
Yes. Yes. Hi, good evening. Uh, it's a very rainy evening here in Mumbai, the type of a, uh, uh, day you want to go to Lonawla and enjoy some rain. Unfortunately, with the lockdown, that's not going to happen. Uh, Ajay uh, mentioned uh, the dilemma between uh, open tubular and endoscopic. I started as a classical uh, open surgeon. I retrained myself somewhere in 2007-8 to understand tubular discectomy because we had a matrix tube since 2002. Unfortunately, we couldn't explore the total extent. So, uh, well, uh, when all of us train on open surgery, that's our field of vision in an open surgery. You can really go right into the foramen, uh, foramen there. However, in a tubular surgery, by just going a little bit eccentric, you increase this. This is more like a 30 degree lens that you put in an arthroscopy, where you know, a zero degree lens would give you straightforward vision, but you uh, put a 30 degree uh, lens and your horizon increases. Similarly, this just increases your horizon. And if you're not happy with what you're seeing, you can always put in a tube from the other side. So that's the uh, uh, drawing of uh, how a tube would increase your vision there. Well. Uh, you have to be very, very oriented to open surgery. If you're not a good open surgeon, you will never ever become a good MIS surgeon because unless you know your anatomy well, you know what structures need to be taken out, you have to, uh, you will not be able to do it through a tube. Tube is essentially doing the same open job through a lesser access trauma and, I'm sorry. Yeah, lesser access trauma, that's the optimization strategy and maintaining the same outcome uh, aims of an open surgery. When you dock a tube for a simple discectomy, your docking is at this site where I have uh, marked it. And this is the view, that's the medial head end, foot end, that's the ligamentum flavum. This what you see here is the lamina. This is what you will be seeing uh, if, when you go through in a tube. In a micro discectomy, you would have a more medial exposure. The advantages of this is the muscle trauma is much less. And uh, that's where a tube would dock if you were to do a discectomy. That's the radiological picture there. If you were to do an extra foraminal, you can do it through a tube. Well, in fact, the best uh, way to do an extra foraminal, in my opinion, is uh, MIS tube. You would just have to dock more laterally. Most of this disc will go behind the ganglion and rise superiorly. So your docking is a little superior to that of the disc space. And well, a fusion, the docking is totally different. That's what you would see if you were to dock for a fusion. Uh, Extending it, if you are able to do your micro discectomy, you can see this uh, awkwardly placed osteoid osteoma here. You can use the same tube to go down there and take it out rather than having to take the whole joint away. So this is the advantages. Uh, uh, the guide wire entry is about three to four centimeters. There's no fixed uh, distance. It all depends on how thin or how fat the patient is. You have, this is the orientation of the patient. Uh, These two uh, holes that you're seeing here that are circles that are marked are the positions of the pedicle below. So that give you an idea where to enter. You would go there for your discectomy, but you would go more laterally to do an extra foraminal discectomy or do a fusion. Well, uh, for decompression, that's the, uh, and a fusion, that's the difference that you'll have. Do it right use your dilators, move them in all the directions so that there is no muscle sticking to the lamina and to the ligamentum flavum so that is, uh, the creep is minimal and your vision is clear. Use serial dilators so that you don't damage the muscle, rather just make a gentle pathway through that. And uh, this is a small video of how to get in there. Uh, I'll just take you fast. Uh, this is I always mark the surface where, uh, with uh, while before operating so that you have an idea where you've got to reach inside. That's the incision, paracentral, open up with an uh, hemostat, serial dilations. So that opens up, uh, that acts like a periosteum to take away all the muscle from the bony structures below. Deploy. This video is now nearly 12 to 13 years old. We used to use an expandable tube quadrant at that time. Always confirm that you are at the correct place. Expandable tubes have an advantage of being, uh, expanding cephalocaudal as well as angulating. You can use a medial lateral retractor to, once you cleaned up, microscope, it's a natural extension of somebody, even in open surgery, that's the clarity of vision you should have. Well, uh, always check your tube positions. Uh, a couple of tips, if you're doing an alpha S1, that's the orientation of the alpha S1 disc, which is at an angle. If you move your head high, 
you are able to make it more uh, perpendicular to the floor of the OT. So you work in a straight line rather than an angle. So it makes your working uh, much easier. Uh, other uh, biggest doubt is, will I be able to see the opposite side? I might have a discectomy to do, but there is, if there's a decompression of the opposite side, so I'll orient here, that's the opposite side, that's the head end, that's the foot end. You can actually see the disc on the opposite side. It's that clear. Uh, is it only possible with expensive equipment? This tube is made uh, from in Maharashtra in Pune by Pitkar uh, Surgical Tools in as little as 45 to 50,000. You should be able to get that's the opposite side, that's the head end, that's the foot end. That's the clarity you should have in the opposite end. This is a 14 year old boy in whom a decompression was necessitated. That's the decompression that you should get. So even Indian tubes are good. You should be able to do. Will it be working in revision scenarios? That's a, you can see the scar of original surgery. That's a recurrent disc. That's the disc that has come out. The beauty of it is it totally avoids the previous scar and it can, uh, it goes through virgin territory. You just have to take care of some of the fibrosis that you will encounter when you land your tube there. Well, uh, two types of tubes, fixed and expandable, each have their own advantages. If you're going to buy one, buy an expandable one because you can keep it closed and use it like a fixed one. Expandable one is a little forgiving. You are able to go multiple levels. It increases uh, uh, cephalo caudal, so you are able to have a uh, better uh, vision. Fixed tubes are very stable. The creep is less. They are very maneuverable. Over the top is much easier, and they're sturdier. They're much, uh, there's much less uh, wear and tear. Uh, there are always advantages of uh, the tubular surgery. Why should you go in for a tubular surgery when open surgery has been around for a century and has proven results? It's a natural extension of open surgery. Most open surgery instruments can be used. It's only the access corridor uh, for, for it, and the access corridor is a minimal investment to graduate higher up there. It has very low access trauma. I'm not saying this. There are papers that have been published uh, uh, about this, multiple. There's very low surgical mobility. It's become daycare. Fusions need 24-hour admissions. It's a very versatile thing. I agree with what um, uh, uh, our, uh, uh, what was said before, that probably a micro discectomy and a tubular discectomy have similar morbidity. But the, pro uh, the trick is not about... Discectomies are, is a very rare surgery in my practice. I would do uh, not even half a dozen in a year because majority of them are taken care of by uh, the pain uh, people. But the extension thereafter, we now, we they graduated to lumbar canal stenosis, to tumors, intradural tumors, to doing fusions, to doing it in high grade listasis, and now deformity. You can use the same tube from the side and uh, do D lifts, O lifts. So getting used to a tubular system, the first thing you'll have to get used to is getting to do a discectomy. Once you master that, you'll move on to a decompression. Then you will move on to a fusion. Then you will move on to doing intradural pathologies. Then you will move on to multiple levels, doing degenerative scoliosis. The, uh, there is always a question of, uh, uh, well, uh, it's very expensive. No, it's not. There are excellent local manufacturers who have very cheap implants. There are better microscopes even manufactured in Ahmedabad, who, which, though, which cost less than, not even a luxury, they cost less than a Toyota Altis today. You can access every kind of disc pathology. You can access intradural, extradural tumors. It makes redo surgery much better because you're taking a, a different plane totally. Dural injuries, if they happen, can be handled. Majority of them can be just left uh, alone because the dead space is less. But even if you do have, there are ways of uh, repairing them. Yeah, there are uh, the my first tube that I had a matrix had a endoscopy portal with a zero uh, degree scope that could be put in. If you want to uh, have an endoscopic vision, you can. However, I prefer to do more with a microscope because it's natural 3D vision. And of course, uh, literature has supported superior outcomes to conventional surgery. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Vishal, uh, on that and uh, a lot of uh, learning points for us. We really can uh, look forward for these various uh, advantages of tubular and uh, discectomy also. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Pramod uh, Lokunde to share his thoughts on endoscopy. Pramod. Yeah. Thank you, Shailesh. Uh, I really like to thank Shailesh for in inviting me for this talk. I would like to thank MOA chairperson, Dr. Shinde, Dr. Karne, and uh, the entire Sanjati team. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. 
so my task is to is to talk about the uh, advantages and benefits of uh, full endoscopic spine surgeries so whenever we talk about minimal invasive spine surgery i think uh, one of the most uh, loudly talked about or uh, probably a very boasted kind of advantage of mi surgery is uh, the size of the skin incision I mean, there is a lot of debate uh, going on that people do uh, uh, discectomies in 12 mm uh, tubes or uh, 14 mm uh, mill mm tube of course i think uh, skin incision size matters uh, because uh, the smaller the skin incision size there is less muscle dissection there is less soft tissue trauma and uh, i think endoscopy does pours over all this because the size of the full endoscopy incision is the smallest 8 mm i think no other surgery can be as comparable to full endoscopy but what i really feel is that uh, this is not the most important advantage which i would like to stress about and there are a lot of other advantages of mi surgeries which we need to focus and which endoscopy fulfills to a significant extent uh, endoscopy is really minimally invasive i think uh, look at this uh, l5s1 disc herniation on the left side uh, you can see that the entire surgery has been done through a <coughs> 2.5 mm slit in the ligamentum flavum there is no bone cut there is no ligamentum flavum removed and uh, if you look at the post operative mri picture there is hardly any muscle damage which is seen as compared to the pre operative mri pictures even the slit in the ligamentum flavum is not seen in the post operative uh, mri uh, picture but what i really feel is that the the real trump card of endoscopy is the presence of a irrigation working channel and this has been the real evolution in endoscopic spine surgery and what the irrigation working channel irrigation fluid does is that it washes out all the blood clots and all the debris and maintains a very clear field of vision the irrigation fluid pressure has a hemostatic effect so there is not much bleeding there and the continuous inflow and the outflow of the fluid it reduces the chances of infection so overall i think the incidence of complications with endoscopy is much less as compared to microscopic surgeries or open surgeries so this is a perfect example of posterior cervical discectomy uh, uh, on the left side we have a microscopic surgery done by an eminent surgeon from john hopkins and on the right side we are doing it with the endoscope and you can see the difference of vision the vision on the right side is so clear and so the tissues are so well defined the anatomy is so well uh, well seen and it really becomes very comfortable for the surgeon uh, to operate and ultimately the results are translated to the patient so as compared to microscope which offers a bifold benefit of magnification and illumination endoscope offers a trifold trifold benefit of magnification illumination as well as clear field of vision another difference between microscope and endoscope is uh, microscope will always uh, give you a bird's eye view the surgeon size always pay a place to uh, far away from the pathology whereas with an endoscope the uh, the surgeon size is at the tip of the endoscope which is just few millimeters away from the pathology and this particular property of the endoscope is really very important especially in uh, surgeries which are located or pathologies which are deep seated especially the thoracic spine so uh, uh, as the depth of the uh, skin incision uh, increases this Uh, as the depth of the uh, surgical field increases the size of the skin incision also increases with the microscope because the uh, if the skin uh, incision size is very small uh, the edges they come in between and they interfere with the transmission of the light as well as vision so uh, this uh, is a perfect example if you are doing a tubular discectomy or a microscopic discectomy the size of lumbar disc uh, incision cannot be translated to that Uh, with uh, a thoracic discectomy where a larger incision or, or a mini thoracotomy has to be performed where you have to open up the pleura we have to cut the uh, rib and then go inside which is a much morbid procedure so this is not there in endoscopy in endoscopy no matter how deep the pathology is uh, the incision size is always the same it is 8 mm in size and this is again a good example of thoracic heart disc centrally located classical indication for anterior thoracotomy and uh, we have done this procedure uh, with an endoscope a small incision the uh, the uh, the dilator is passed over the pleura and under the rib till it reaches the rib head and over which the working channel is inserted and you can see that the entire surgery is pro uh, performed through a very small incision 
and we uh, the visualization visualization is excellent and this uh, surgery does not uh, violate the thoracic uh, cavity and there is no chest drain inserted the patient can be mobilized the same evening and even can be discharged the next day uh, what Vishal has failed to tell us is uh, he has not told us about the wound healing problems of a, uh, uh, of a tubular retractor system, especially the expandable ones. The more you expand, try, uh, trying to look in, inside because of uh, a deep-seated cavity, uh, the, the more is the pressure uh, necrosis of the skin edges and ultimately the, some of the patients may end up with this kind of skin problems, which is not seen in endoscopy. Endoscopy always offers a target specific approach. What is the purpose of minimal invasive spine surgery? The purpose of the minimal in invasive spine surgery is to minimize the access portal related injury. That means till you reach the pathology, whatever you're cutting, normal structures you're cutting in between, you have to minimize that. You have to minimize the soft tissue injury and you have to minimize the bony injury. And ultimately all this is uh, done to avoid bony fusion. So endoscope, uh, allows the possibility to choose a need-based approach. So we have multiple approaches uh, which uh, are, uh, you know, you choose the approach depending on which is the closest and which is uh, passing to the least area of, you know, vital structures and uh, without, uh, you know, uh, uh, compromising the bony uh, stability. And uh, this is one of the real advantage of endoscope. So here is again a perfect example, a L23 recurrent disc after a laminectomy, you can see it is down migrated and it is centrally located. What would you do if you use a microscope and a tube? You'd always extend the laminectomy and in this case, uh, you might have to convert it into a fusion surgery because there is not much facet left. So we have done this procedure through a transformal approach under local anesthesia and you can see that the disc herniation can be removed so easily and the entire procedure has been done in like 30 minutes or so. And this is the neural decompression that you see. And this is the site of disc herniation. This is the posterior annulus and this is the uh, nerve which is pulsating well. And these are the post-operative MRI pictures which you see. Again, another case of, uh, you know, where stability is not compromised, a two-level stenosis, L4-5, L5-S1, we have got a stable listhesis at L4-5, L4 can we avoid fusion in this case? Yes, we can, we can do an over-the-top decompression, and because the minimalistic, uh, you know, uh, damage which is uh, done with an endoscope, uh, the, uh, the instability is not aggravated, and there are good results with this kind of only decompression procedures. And this is what we have done. Uh, during the over-the-top decompression, the tilting of the endoscope allows you to look at the contralateral side very well. This, this kind of vision is not uh, possible with the help of a microscope because it has limitations of tilting. You combine it with a table tilt, but uh, with an endoscope, which is just a narrow tube, you just pass it under the lamina, under the spinous process, and you can reach the opposite side. So the complications of uh, decompressing the contralateral side are minimal in endoscopic surgeries. So these are the post-operative images and you can see two separate in eight millimeter incisions in the same patient. Another misunderstanding among, amongst the most microscopic or, you know, or tube surgeons are that uh, the indications of endoscopy are very limited and it's not a very versatile procedure. Most people feel that only some disc herniations can be removed and very little uh, cases of very limited cases of uh, lumbar canal stenosis can be decompressed with this. But I think this is not there. Uh, this is not so we have, uh, you know, we are able to remove entire all kinds of disc herniations and uh, decompressions uh, can be performed. And at the same time, we are trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, look into other pathologies like infections, deformities and tumors also. And we have seen good results with this. So here are a few case examples. In infection, there is an extensive epidural abscess. You can see in this patient, uh, right extending from L1 vertebra right up to S2 vertebra. The, uh, the lower part of the abscess is very thick uh, uh, with caseous tissue and the upper part is liquid in, uh, you know, state. And can we do endoscopy in this case? Yes, we have done. We have done an interlaminar approach at L5-S1 level. And uh, we have just removed the caseous tissue manually after the retraction of the nerve root with the uh, working channel. You can see the manual removal of the caseous tissue. 
and uh, once that was removed completely we just passed a thin silicon catheter catheter upwards and we aspirated the liquid abscess and uh, washed it thoroughly with uh, irrigation fluid and these are the post operative mri pictures after 6 months and you, you can hardly see any sign of surgery there the muscles entirely look normal the disc space looks normal the epidural space looks normal Uh, uh there is no evidence that any surgery has been done in this case with complete relief of the patient so this is what uh, you can uh, get uh, the extent of reach uh, with an endoscope through the interlaminar space you can you are able to tilt it upwards and downwards in all direction here you can see it is uh, reaching right up to the lower border of the l4 vertebra and uh, this is the extent of decompression which you can get with this endoscopy another case a uh, case of tubercular spondylodiscitis with fold abscess uh, moderate destruction of the bony end plates and you can see there is a large abscess along the iliacus muscle entering into the pelvis so what are the aims of surgery in the such patients you take a biopsy you debride the disc space you drain the abscess and you have perform you need to perform fusion if it is necessary in this case it is necessary so can we do this endoscopically yes i have tried it we have done a l5s1 interlaminar approach right sided and we have debrided it thoroughly and uh, because we are doing it under vision we are able to tease the anterior annulus uh, with the forceps and once the uh, communication between the uh, uh, the pelvic abscess and the disc space is restored this is what you get you you just the abscess just starts draining out through the endoscopy tube and a huge volume of abscess was removed in this way and uh, we later on once the abscess was drained the disc space was thoroughly washed out we removed some uh, ila uh, bone graft from the posterior iliac crest and we inserted uh, followed by uh, fixation later on another can we do it for tumors yes i have done it uh, uh, this is one of my uh, patients young patient 27 year old male patient which i had operated 10 years back a case of non hodgkins lymphoma initially i had done lumbar decompression followed by chemotherapy again there was recurrence uh, with cervical involvement cervical thoracic and cervical and we again operated front back for that 7 years back again the patient went for chemotherapies multiple chemotherapies multiple recurrences and uh, ultimately in one of the chemo session he almost uh, developed a light life threatening reaction and following that the uh, the the onco physician if he refused to give any any kind of chemotherapy and there was recurrence with severe right anterior thigh pain you can see the tumor is involving the right uh, sided foramen of l34 and l45 there you can see here and the plan was to do a transforaminal decompression on bo both the levels to decompress the ex exiting nerve roots here the main, main challenge for us is to define the anatomy properly because it's so very difficult with the tumor mass invading from all the sides but we were able to manage that and this uh, is uh, the well decompressed exiting nerve root on the right side uh, and this is the disc space and this is the facet joint here so the patient had complete post uh, relief uh, of pain post operatively and had almost for one and a half months after which the patient uh, you know developed some other complications related to nh so can we do it for deformities uh, irreducible c1 c2 instability uh, in the cervical spine uh, what are the treatment uh, treatment options there are multiple ways of belling this cat and one of the treatment option which i personally so, uh, sorry to interject uh, could yeah. you limit your talk to the lumbar disc yeah this is second second last slide yeah, i'll just keep talking about the lumbar disc it's a debate on the lumbar disc please sir yeah i just wanted to uh, demonstrate the extent of you know in thank, you, thank you no problem no problem so this is again one of the treatment options anterior release uh, uh, followed by posterior fixation so during the anterior release we take a high retropharyngeal approach and we release the longus scola uh, capitis and the anterior capsule so can we do this anterior procedure endoscopically yes we have done it a small incision about uh, 8 or 10 cm i just dissected out and uh, you know uh, manually and we inserted the dilator and the cannula on top of it and there's the endoscope which is going in and uh, you can see the position of the uh, working channel uh, working channel at the uh, at the c1 c2 junction and this is the probe which is probing the uh, disc uh, the, the joint and this is the forceps which is removing the 
uh, thick and soft tissues. And this is the joint, there you see. And uh, that's the joint. Uh, I've drilled it a little bit just to decorticate and open up the joint so that it becomes mobile. This is the C1, C2 joint. You can see the 30 degrees angled endoscope allows you to look under and into the joint directly. And this was followed by posterior fixation, a well-reduced uh, C1, C2 instability. So the take home message is uh, full endoscopy is a very sophisticated and highly evolved forms of minimally invasive spine surgeries. It offers trifold benefits of illumination, magnification and clear field of vision due to irrigation. It offer, uh, there is a possibility of target specific approach which minimizes the access related injury and avoids fusion. Endoscopic ass uh, assisted procedures, uh, if you combine them with open surgeries, they can help us to reduce the morbidity of the open surgery. And it is an excellent procedure for difficult to access areas in thoracic and cervical spine. And there is a huge potential to explore the use of endoscopies in pathologies other than degenerative spinal diseases. Thank you. A great uh, work and presentation, uh, but I think slightly away from, drifted away from our uh, basic debate of lumbar disc. Uh, we would like to invite Dr. Uh, Sushil Patkar, sir, for the open or micro uh, lumbar spine uh, for lumbar disc. Over to you, Patkar, sir. Is my presentation visible? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So I'm feeling like a dinosaur after listening to all these stalwarts who are doing all complex modern uh, spinal surgery. Uh, but I have been fortunate that I started uh, way back, uh, long before all of you guys, most of Ram and all, we are from a different era. And I actually began when there was no CT scan. I began by doing myelograms, then CT scan came in, then MRI came in, then uh, the microscope came in. Uh, so I have got a spectrum from where I have come and where I am now. So probably my way of thinking might be look a little uh, geriatric to many of you guys, but it has stood the test of time and it is still working for me and I'm still in the business. So uh, what I want to say, and I want to, of course, uh, progress of surgery lies in self-analysis and minimalization till like Ram said, that for a given surgical problem, we have to find a non-surgical solution. Who are we? We are barbarians trying to get with the knife, with the endoscope, with the tubular dilator, something that we cannot with our intelligence. So if we can find a non-surgical answer, it will be superior. Till that time, this debate will go on. So uh, let me get on with my job. So uh, if you will see somehow uh, the incidence and the indication for spinal surgery has boomed in the last 20 years. And this boom has come predominantly from either the Western world or from the very, very far east like Korea, where I don't know whether the same indications for surgery are used in the rest of the world. So she Maybe in America, full, it is... Sushil, so sorry to interrupt. Can you go to full screen, please, at the bottom of the screen? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you, yes. sir. Can you now see me full screen? But then you, this is coming in my way. What is this? Yeah, this okay. Now it's all right. It's all right now. So uh, if you see the boom in spinal surgery, so there is some kind of discrepancy because most of the work about endoscopy started coming from Korea and most of the work for tubular surgery started coming from America. So there was some confusion going on. But if you see that, you know, surgery in disc is about timing. If you're at the right time, your patient gets relieved and you're jumping and you're publishing and the patient is jumping. But there is a significant group of patients who will have spontaneous regression and nobody wants to talk about them. And if you compare the results of, you know, uh, spontaneous regression and surgical versus non-operative treatment, you will find that over a period of time, there has been a lot of uh, developing uh, evidence that most of these cases which have been offered this surgery probably do not require surgery. 
So clinical outcomes do not depend upon the size of the herniation, the grade of the degeneration of the intervertebral disc, seven-year follow -up. Mechanical embarrassment of neural elements by definable structural abnormalities is inadequate as a sole explanation because you know that the size of the disc and pain are variable and inflammation also has been considered. So there is a need for minimization. There is no doubt about it. There is you know, muscle injury, there's epidural scar, disc settlement, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, people went on from laminectomy to hemilaminectomy to penetration to microlumbar, and now microendoscopic and endoscopic. So the whole argument of you know separating the muscle versus dilatation of the tube, I think, is a very very frivolous argument because this whole argument was based on the multifidus. And what most tubular that that people who use the tube or the descant who don't show is that their first step after reaching there is to pull out some muscle. They put the biopsy forceps and they pull out the muscle and then they show the lamina and this is the ligament of flavum, but they don't show that they pull out, yank out some muscle, which is never done with microscope. So this is how it progressed. There was, you know, this laminectomy, then the tubular came in, in between microlumbar came in, and then now uh, bipodal endoscopic discectivity. Now, is it really minimally uh, in access or is it really minimally in this? Because essentially the work done inside is same uh, the muscle injury and the talk about muscle injury, is that trade worth it? You know, is the adequacy of decompression, dural injuries, recurrences, and radiation exposure, same as decreased post, does this trade off work with decreased post op pain, decreased hospital stay, and better outcomes? I don't know. This whole talk about muscle injury started way back from the Japanese people, Hanikata and Kawaguchi, and they started talking about muscle injury. But nobody provided any evidence. Nobody provided any evidence that really muscle injury had a big role to play in better outcomes. So type of surgery is not relevant. Dispatch of symptoms and radiology, evidence of chemical factors, are undeniable natural regression in a large number of patients. Just like Samir said in his talk that he has stopped doing anterior cervical surgery for the radical. I stopped doing lumbar disc surgery unless and until the person patient really begs for it. Everybody talks about you know, waiting for six weeks, eight weeks but hardly anybody tells the patient that you have to wait for six to eight weeks and the good chance that you'll become all right without any surgical treatment. Way back, 1983, 2010, and now I'll show you for the recent literature, no real strong evidence for to do lumbar disc surgery in the first place, in spite of such a lot of water flowing under the bridge. Surgical versus non-operative treatment of a lumbar disc carnation what is the conclusion? 2018, low quality of evidence suggested that surgical treatment is more effective than non-operative treatment in improving physical functions. No significant difference was observed in adverse events. No firm recommendation can be given. 2018, 2018, still you are not sure where, why you are operating the patient. Did, do you tell the patient that there's a good chance it's going to become all right? Don't. So this fight goes on. The only thing that I find is that surgery definitely helps to relieve the pain faster. Surgery so definitely helps to relieve the pain faster. And therefore, I think the name of the operation has to be changed, and the name of the operation should be lumbar nerve root decompression and not discect. The aim of the operation should decompress the root. How you do it and how you reduce the complications, that is the important thing. Of course, even I got fascinated by Rutan, by Gun Choi. I went to these guys, spent some time with them, Anthony Young, our good friend. And uh, then, of course, I started doing um, uh, endoscopic disc surgery. Uh, this was, you know, I think about eight to 10 years ago. And everybody, all endoscopic disc surgeons enjoy this thing on table, telling the patient to smile, lift up the leg, move the toes. That time I had a visitor from the UK who had come to spend some time with me from King's Hospital to learn about lumbar endoscopic disc surgery. My friend, Pandaram Kulkarni. And uh, this went on, and uh, I found that, you know, yes, uh, lumbar, disc surgery, lumbar disc surgery is, uh, is a good option, and you can remove large sequestrated disc by this procedure. Yes, I agree that you could do this op operation, and uh, it was a good operation. I was the first to publish my work in uh, uh, Neurology India, then, of course, in the World Federation textbook. But then, then I was also interacting with Mr. Gokhale, and his brother, Shankar Gokhale, had died of lymphoma. He had died of lymphoma because of radiation exposure. And that is what woke me up. How many of us are ready to do all this, to wear this thyroid shield, to wear the, you know, red corneal shield and the lead gown? And I suddenly started to realize I'm not using all this. 
And then I was, how many, I, I'm a neurosurgeon, I'm a microsurgeon. And somebody said that microscope, a microscope is still used to remove tumors from the brainstem. My dear, the microscope is extremely a fantastic gadget because you are, both your hands are free. You are using it to remove tumors from the brainstem where your basic soul resides. So if you are going to wear all this, just because you want to keep that hole small in a non-life-saving surgery, my God, thank you very much. I started revising. I went back to literature and started searching evidence. Even now, recently, I came across that radiation exposure, very important aspect in spine surgery, not only for you, but also for the people assisting you and the staff. Colin Powell justified putting bombs on Iraq. Oh, he, he went to the, he spoke in WHO and God, you know, the voting. And then they said, either you are with us or against us. And they went on to kill 6 million people. The efficacy of minimally invasive discectomy compared with open discectomy, meta-analysis perspective. What do they say? Adequate decomposition regardless of the operative. Regardless of the operative. Evolving evidence. 2011, does minimal surgery lumbar disease result in less muscle injury? Not sure. Not sure. 855 patients with central stenosis, open surgery is as good as endoscopic surgery or microsurgery, 2011. Now I'm being progressed further. Don't worry, I'm not going to remain in 2011. So you, you'll find that, you know, there is unnecessary spinal surgery going on. One surgeon's experience, Epstein, Nancy, a good friend of mine from US, more now with root injuries occur with minimally invasive surgery. Let's tell someone, let's tell someone. I'm sure that there are many Pramod Lapandes who are very good, but everybody is not Pramod Lapandes. MIS and standard open surgery can effectively manage pain with lumbar stenosis and lead to comparable clinical outcomes. More studies are necessary to find the efficacy of MIS. This is when? 2017, 793 patients. No significant difference found. Conclusion, central... Uh, Decompression is a very, very good operation, 2017. 2018, what is the conclusion of this study? A comparison of percutaneous endoscopic lumbar discectomy and open lumbar microdiscectomy for lumbar discoordination. Conclusion is large sample side, everybody, there are these, all these, you know, what I call them, you know, soul warriors, Lord Lancelot. Each one comes and talks about his experience and how fantastically he can do the operation. An operation is a good operation if it can be done by the reasonably trained person, by the reasonably, uh, what do you say, adept person, there are going to be some high flyers who are going to be very good. But for an operation to become popular, it should be like Bassini's operation for hernia repair. So everybody can do it and anybody can do it. It should not be something complex. If it's complex, it requires a lot of instrumentation. Then that operation has to still evolve and the surgeon also has to still evolve. Kanta came, my very good friend, he came with a stenoscope and he started doing, I've been invited him to India twice. And what is, what is his paper say? Prospective randomized clinical trials are strongly warranted even in 2018. Still, 2004 years ago, still warranted. Not sure still. Endoscopic lumbar surgery, the state of the art, 2019. Additional high quality research assessing the outcomes of endoscopy, because these people are looking at the spectrum. They're not looking at individual warriors. They're looking at the spectrum. Mind you, these guys are good. Comparison of clinical effectiveness of tubular microdiscectomy with conventional microdiscectomy. Conclusion, the one-year benefits of TMD are similar to that of, of conventional microdiscectomy. Four RCTs, 605 patients, 610 individuals. And what do they say? TMD, TMD was superior to CMD considering post-operative um, uh, disability index but only for a small period of time. Lumbar dyspectrum, tubular M or MLD is very safe and effective. Probably do not warrant the transition. This is our friend Kundani's article from Bombay Hospital. And this is a very recent article. What do they find? What do they conclude? It does not warrant you to switch over from microsurgical approach to tubular dyspectrum or minimally. I do not completely agree with you. You must keep on evolving. But yes, you must question and look at, the, at what you can do better. And I, I think a microscope is still a fantastic gadget which is used to do the most complex surgeries on the human brain, that is brainstem tumor. There cannot be an operation more complex than that. And endoscope will not replace the microscope in doing surgery because you need two hands. Endoscope is all right as long as there is no bleeding, as long as it is not life saving. Lumbar discectomy is tubular endoscopic discectomy better, better than transitional microdiscectomy. What, what do they say? Post operative lumbar pain is less, yes. It deals with endoscopic discectomy than conventional discectomy, but only for three months. Only for three months. 
So for those for those three months, uh, this whole fight is going on for three months. I don't know. I'm not sure. A comparison of percutaneous endoscopic lumbar discectomy and open lumbar microdiscectomy. Microdiscectomy still showed good clinical results. A randomized controlled trial with large sample size would be relevant, necessary. And they have searched the literature from 1973 to 2018. And still no conclusion. Look at all this. This, this is the evidence on, on micro, minimally invasive surgery. And all of them, what do, what do they conclude? No significant out difference. No significant, no significant, no significant. No difference, no significance. So where are we? What are we talking? Why are we making discectomy more complex? Why do we need so many gadgets just to you know, have your breakfast? So I began with this. Then this came in. This was the incision. Come today, go tomorrow. Operation, as we used to say, when I was with Dr. Ramani. And I still talk about it as come today. I feel that wound healing has phases. You know, There's a phase of hematoma resorption. The second phase is the phase of inflammation when the pain increases. And the third phase is the phase of you know, hematoma resorption and granulation tissue deposition. And then finally healing. I don't think you should insist on discharging the patient in the stage of wound inflammation is over. I think it is a, just a kind of you know, overkill trying to discharge patients earlier. So from this, this was the only instrument that I needed. You know, From there to this and this. Looking down and trying to remove with you know the thing with a, uh, losing one hand from the surgery and you know with so many gadgets I could do this operation and I still do this operation never more than one hour never more than one hour and I have done endoscopic dissol so I've published my work I've done more than 150 of them my work has been published all over but I I felt that I have to come back I don't think endoscopy is the answer maybe something better has to come up most of the you know the relief is in the truth. There are fantastic abstracts, fantastic introductions, and people don't talk about the results. There's no need to have such a complex thing for this kind of job. It can be done with a small micro lumbar retractor within a few minutes. Colin Powell had to retract. Ultimately, he had to come and say after killing 6 million Iraqis, that I did not have the evidence. That evidence given to me was wrong. And it was a painful blot in my life. And he could, have be, he could have become president of America before Obama, but I had to step down because his conscience told him that what he did was wrong. The New York Times, I helped sell the false choice of war. I don't want to sell the false choice of you know, endoscopy, at least at this point in time. So non-surgical treatment has resulted in less improvement than surgery, especially where the relief of pain. But non-surgical treatment is still a negotiable option because bulk of the patient becomes, still become all right without surgery. Very few ultimately would persist. Beyond. There, there are multiple papers. We said some people are now talking about waiting for up to six months before offering surgery. Then, how, what, what to do? What should the, what should the next generation do? I say the next generation should train in, in endoscopy surgery, but they must train properly. That training consists of you know properly identifying leaders or centers where this training is given, not just attending one workshop or going to some one meeting and then coming back and buying the endoscope. In this study, Anthony Young said that minimum 72 procedures have to be done under supervision before you reach a reasonable level of competence, but still you are open to having competition. How many of them are ready to do that? If you want to become another Pramod Lokande or William or Peshetiwar, uh, uh, you have to go and you know, spend time with somebody who is doing them. Unfortunately, if you want to become you know, single level, uh, single workshop surgeons. We have our own people like you know, Satish Chandra. Standu, etc. You are not entitled to your opinion. You are entitled to your informed opinion. No one is entitled to be ignorant. Thank you very much, my dear. Thank you very much, Sushil. That was a fantastic presentation. We've heard Vishal, Peshativar, Pramod Lokhande, and Sushil Patkar telling us how they decompress the nerve root, which is the aim of the surgery finally. Before we get into the debate and the three of them have rebuttals, I'd like three people to give their inputs. We have a very senior orthopedic surgeon who does spine on a regular basis, which is Dr. Shinde, our president of the MOA. And we have both Dr. Samir Dalvi and our good friend, Dr. Deshpande. So beginning with Dr. Shinde, then Dalvi, then Deshpande, your inputs on what you heard from these three gentlemen. Dr. Shinde, please. Dr. Ajit Shinde, are you there? 
Okay, uh, Samir, over to you. Inputs from you, Samir. Uh, yeah, hi. Can uh, Dr. Patkar unscreen, unshare his screen because? How do I do that? I'm trying to do that. I'm unable Same to get out. Share screen. Same thing as share screen. There you press it again. It will be no, unshare. I, I, I should press stop share. Okay. Ah, stop share. Yes. Okay, wow. fine. Thank you. I'm out now. So, uh, as this uh, thing has shown, uh, Dr. Patkar is a little slow on technology. <laughs> but I must say one thing that uh, the dinosaur has eaten up the young Turks. The young Turks, Vishal and Pramod, have been completely eaten up by this uh, so-called dinosaur, self-styled dinosaur. And uh, Dr. Patkar's presentation has been absolutely hard-hitting and excellent. And I think he has absolutely proven his point in uh, delivering science and rational medicine uh, to the patients who come to us. Uh, regarding my own, uh, so regarding the debate, I would say that uh, Sushil Patkar has won hands down. And uh, in the middle, I was totally confused as to what is happening. Because uh, Vishal seemed to be selling Binaka toothpaste. And uh, Pramod Lokhande looks like he was selling some, uh, you know, pantaloon shirts and t-shirts rather than uh, talking about lumbar disc. Because he was showing everything except lumbar disc. So my advice to you as a senior faculty is next time you are given a topic, please stick to the topic. Don't use these talks to talk about everything else. Because it is not appreciated. Sorry about that. I'm being very harsh, but it's true. Now to get back to the topic itself. Uh, my own choice is the lumbar microdiscectomy. I'm trained with it with Gordon Findlay, one of the first guys. It gives predictable, excellent results. And in my hand, it is a completely result-oriented surgery. I don't see any major advantage of the tube over a microdiscectomy. Having said that, if a patient comes and says he wants a tube, I use it. And especially in obese patients, a tube is very good because this, uh, you know, the incision and the thing, the retractor sitting is much better. So yes, I, my number one choice is a microdiscectomy because in that we uh, reflect the fascia, we don't bite it out as Patkar put it. And my second choice would be a tube. Regarding Dr. Lokhande's technique for doing the discectomy, it is, I mean, I am extremely uh, curious about it and I'm extremely, um, uh, you know, I have extreme curiosity and my intuition tells me that it is probably a good technique to do if done properly. And uh, I think the biggest key to that is that it is immensely dependent on technique and experience. And what Dr. Uh, you know, Patkar clearly pointed out that you need the experience of somebody like Lokhande or somebody like who the people who do it, Gunchoy and all these people to deliver results. And if you don't have that experience, you will deliver very bad results. So the first thing in that is learning the technique and experience. That's the first thing. And the second, which is very, very important is case selection which means that out of 100 cases, there may be 20 cases which nobody can do endoscopy, including Lokhande. But there may be 80 cases which Lokhande can do, but there may be only 20 which Vishal can do, and there may be only 3 which I can do. So I should not try to do those which Lokhande can do and which Vishal can do. So this experience and technique and selection of the cases is what will give the result finally. And eventually, all of us this Saturday evening, sacrificing our beer and sacrificing our party, is for only one thing. It is to deliver good outcomes to our patients. Nothing else matters. And in doing that, you have to be honest to yourself and to the science. So that's my words. Thanks, Samir. Dr. Deshpande and then Dr. Ajit Shinde. So it was a wonderful debate. I have no questions about the quality of the surgeons who deliver such wonderful debates. Each has a perspective. My take is on several levels. And it is really surprising because I didn't anticipate this in this debate. The first level that I want to tell everybody who is still raising in their experience is to the extent of skill levels these surgeons have you know, attained themselves. These are really very highly skilled people. That's number one. The second thing that comes is just not learning the technique. It is about selecting the technique for that individual patient or for that individual indication. That's the second learning. Third is, beyond all this, that iota of experience you add, the masala, to make a decision. But most importantly, what it is really disturbing is that evidence-based medicine has lost its way because you have evidence 
right, left, and center. It is becoming like searching for a needle in a haystack or hunting for a diamond in the dust. So how do we make out all these things? If I start learning, I'm luckily I'm not in that age group to start from the beginning. I really sympathize with the young surgeons of today. Should I go like this? Should I go like this? Should I listen to a Potkar or a Lokhande or a Vishal Peshrawar? But everybody is good. How do I make a decision about what I need to become? So that is a very difficult choice. And give me a minute, please, because this is very important to discuss. I think, I think individual surgeons have a great ability to expand their knowledge in a way they think their hand-eye coordination and their thought process go. And they should try to explore it on a consistent, practice-oriented, with respect to the technique uh, not being the paramount of importance, very important, but in relation to the needs of the patient. That's number one. If you ask me what I did and why I chose a tube, because I do transnasal endoscopy to the brain, which I think, and Pramod will understand, is a very competent way of doing certain diseases of the brain through the nose. But I don't choose to do that for spine. And there's one reason for it. And the reason is, not because I can't do it, I don't want to do it, or the instrumentation. The reason is whatever I learn has to have a stepwise application to the next level. So I do a discectomy, then the same thing can be used for decompression. A similar technique can be used for one level fusion or a multi-level fusion, then tumors, then you know uh, corrections of scoliosis or deformities or whatever. So one level of technique has given me a big stem from which I can grow the branches. So I think a young surgeon should start thinking about what he wishes to do 10, 15 years down the line, though it's very difficult to decide now. But I want to tell you one thing, that there is no technique which has really said that that is the only way, no other way. Endoscopy is, again, like cervical disc replacement in a phase where surgeons are really enamored with the way it does things. And you go really everywhere, but then over time you again start realizing that it is good for such things and all. I think it's in that phase. Second, if endoscopy were to add the beauty of fusion, which is coming up now, then I think indications will expand and there will be certain set of surgeons who are very adept at it. So I think this discussion today was on multiple levels, and I'm really, really surprised and very happy to have been part of it. One is, as it said, the technique. Second is the perspective of a surgeon. You know, he calls himself a dinosaur, which is his own thing. It is his uh, uh, vastness of thinking in trying to understand how to view a problem in different ways. And the third one is how to, the third surgeon said, how to utilize a technique in a very beautiful way. I think if you take it on different levels, all these things are. A, Fantastic learning today. Thank you once again for giving me that opportunity to see and listen. Thank you, Dr. Deshpande. Some words from a very senior person who does spine on a regular basis, Dr. Ajit Chinde. Please, sir. The newer techniques are better to see, better to listen, but the learning curve is uh, very steep. Secondly, the question is, of affordable. I think some internet. Uh... Yeah, I can't hear him. The compression is more than enough for the red. That our level peripherally, we are most of the time doing the surgery where we are doing decompression. And that to maximum, then we are doing fusion and instrumentation. So and we are not at all tackling cervical spine. So I am not having experience about the cervical thing. I am having experience of the lumbar thing. So these are the things where you are doing practice. Okay. 
Vishal is practicing at Mumbai, or uh, XYZ is practicing at Bangalore, or Samir is practicing at Hinduja, then they can do all these things. But I don't think at a peripheral level how it is possible to do for us. This is my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Shinde. Dr. Karne, as an orthopedic surgeon who does spine, how would you look at this debate? Because a lumbar disc is something which commonly comes to most orthopedic surgeons. Yeah. Karne, sir. Dr. Karne, are you with us? Okay, probably he's not with us. Uh, he can join us later. Now, you all have two minutes each, which is Vishal, um, Pramod, and Sushil. Last words to either protect yourself or show the other guy down. Vishal, you go first. Okay, sir, I may take a little more than two minutes. Just bear with me. I uh, personally don't believe in getting uh, down to the level of doing personal attacks. So I'm not going to go there. But uh, And there is a big assumption amongst a lot of people that uh, just because somebody adapts new technology, he's probably doing unethical surgeries. Uh, I very clearly mentioned in my talk that we do less than half a dozen discectomies in a year. Uh, the institute I work in is considered to be one of the apex ones, and we see a fair amount. But uh, because we follow the protocols, uh, it goes down to that low level because our pain team really looks after most of it. And it's a, verifi a verifiable fact. Having said it, uh, I mean, uh, every technique has its uh, place under the sun. There are cases, I, it's not that I don't do open surgeries. It's not that I don't do a transfer. I, mean, I bought my first young scope in 2005. I gave up doing majority of it because there were recurrences and my training was probably not adequate. Uh, every technique, like Dr. Rajkumar uh, Deshwande uh, correctly said, has its own uh, ladder effect where you rise with it. So we started with a discectomy, progressed now today, we do high grade uh, listesis and all. This has happened over the past 15 to 16 years. And everybody talks about a learning curve. It's not like that uh, you get up and you start doing lumbar discectomies as a first part. In fact, in our orthopedic training, the exposure was given to us in the third post. A discectomy would start at fifth uh, post or maybe after you have become an MS. Everything has a learning curve. So we are making too much of a learning curve uh, thing for it. As for expenses, uh, see, I mean, there are uh, surgeons who make point of, array. it's a very expensive surgery. Uh, that's why I prefer open surgeries. And these are the surgeons who come in BMW and Mercedes. And we are so-called minimal access surgeon using equipment uh, that is uh, very expensive. But I personally drive a Maruti 800 and a Volkswagen. So that's the difference. You have to decide where you want to invest. You can invest in a 50 lakh car or you can invest in a 50 lakh setup. I would rather be in a Ferrari when I'm operating for eight hours in my day rather be, than be in a Bullock cart uh, for eight hours a day. So technology is an enabler. Would you go back in a Bullock cart? No. There are places where probably a car won't go. You'll take a Bullock cart there. But then you wouldn't. that wouldn't be your treatment of choice. As we go forward, the whole idea is to reduce the footprint. The future is not even going to be tubular. It's going to be endoscopy. But today... The gold standard is no longer a micro discectomy. It has moved to a tubular discectomy. The reason is endoscopy, like Dr. Patkap, uh, you have one hand working. When we do it, we realize the uh, inability to reach the medial parts. As, as with experience, we're sure we'll go there. The Koreans have already started doing fusions there. Each procedure is going to have its own side effect. Doesn't mean it is bad. You have to tailor make. You have to do what is good in your hands. In our hands, we uh, consistently proved that this is done well. And uh, I think uh, for youngsters, what happens is when somebody says, hey, nee, this has been going on for 40 years. 40 years back, I'm sure that we drove an ambassador car. Today is driving a Beamer, right? So there is an upward movement in technology there. Similarly, we don't want the youngsters to feel that, okay, only open surgery is the way to go. You have to adapt to new technology. When we started pedicle screws, inserting one pedicle screw, uh, one level pedicle fusion would take four to five hours because we, those Steffi screws do x-rays, C arms were not there, but we move forward from there. So I think we should use technology definitely. It should be a part of our uh, armamentum. You should use it judiciously. If you want, money is an issue to invest in an instrument that's going to last long. In fact, if you're alone, your only fallback is going to be good equipment. I stay in a rented house, but I have equipment that's probably close to a crore of rupees that is mine. 
so that that is the only fallback i have and that's what should be the uh, goal for everyone and yes uh, if what you are doing today is going to be outdated tomorrow so if you want to be left in a race where you are just going to make points saying that oh no but this is still, that, no you want to be current you need to adapt technology that's where the future is going eventually there will be a time when you would probably have an uh, retrovirus going in correcting the damaged dna and uh, regeneration of the disc but till that time you have to minimize the trauma that you do for your surgeries thanks vishal dr lokhande pramod please yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i think uh, one of the phobias associated with endoscopy i think is the uh, failure to unlearn and relearn uh, things you know this is an in- important part of education you know once we most of the times people feel that once we learn something and it is good in my hands they usually don't like to leave it and there is always going to be you know iphone 1 and there is going to be iphone 15 you know nobody sticks up uh, with iphone 1 you have to move on you know even though you don't update every year but at least once in 3 4 years if the technology not all technologies are you know uh, you know promising but obviously i i would uh, uh, you know request the youngsters to watch out you know take a decision see whether that techno that particular technology is working in your practice look out get proper training it is not something see uh, migrating from a open laminectomy to a microendoscopic discectomy were, was much easier you know because uh, the inside job was almost the same but migrating from a microscope to an endoscope is a totally different thing you have to you know unlearn a lot of things and you have to relearn a lot of things and it needs flexibility and uh, i think uh, you know the youngsters uh, should take this into consideration initially not all cases are to be you know uh, treated with endoscope you don't proclaim yourself as an endoscopic surgeon you are always an open surgeon you get experience you learn you try to become more bold you adapt in new you know indications you learn about it you may make mistakes it's going to be a bipolar learning curve initially you will have some success then as you become more bold and you extend your indications you may have some failures but you have to be very adamant you have to be persistent and you have to keep on working try to work on that you know we have spent a lot of time every uh, surgery we used to do i used to record the entire video i used to do a post operative mri and i used to watch that video again and again to see where my surgical uh, you know failure was what was uh, wrong which i did in that particular surgery and we used to maintain a log book of that you know to improve next time so next time if i get a same kind of case i used to always read up that first and then you know prepare your mind accordingly and see to it that you don't miss, make the same kind of mistakes which you had done previously so this kind of slow and steady and consistent learning is uh, something which is very very necessary and it is not something which you you know you are going to learn overnight it takes time but once you you know learn it properly i think uh, it becomes so so easy for me doing a, a endoscopic discectomy is much more in regular cases is much 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 more easier as compared to open or microscopic uh, microscopic surgeries so this is what i would like to uh, you know uh, uh, advise my youngsters that get a structured learning program learn properly the technique you have to spend lot of time on cadavers you know you have to think rethink because you are not seeing anything from the outside it's just an endoscope there is just skin and endoscope everything till the scope reaches the pathology everything is a three dimensional imagination which is supported by a fluoroscopy machine so you have to get your anatomy you have to prepare uh, your the image of the pathology uh on pre based on the pre operative mri pictures you have to project it intraoperatively and you have to do the surgery this is the way a structured learning program is something which and obviously we need mentors for this because this is something which is new it is not you are, you have left something which is old and you are jumping on to something which is new so anything new needs a proper learning technique uh, program and you need mentorship for it so this is what i would advise the young uh, youngsters Thank you very much, Pramod. Those are excellent tips. And finally, now to the man who called himself the dinosaur. Next, Sushil Patel. Yeah, yeah. I think Ram uh, 
I am very impressed with both these uh, the previous speakers. Uh, I was recently giving a lecture for uh, this uh, Trivandrum uh, Medical College and Nimans. And somebody asked me, you know, is it okay if we take up spinal surgery as a, as a kind of career choice? Neurosurgeons, I was, of course, I was giving a lecture for neurosurgeons. So I said, uh, don't restrict yourself by this word spinal surgery, because now the era has come about talking about being an endoscopic spine surgeon or you know, probably becoming a minimally invasive surgeon. But I, what I uh, want to say that this, this debate purpose, debate was not, you know, slamming each other, but it was to give out a message for youngsters who are listening to learn. I personally feel to learn good endoscopic disc surgery or minimally invasive surgery, I think a long tenure in public hospitals after finishing your, your qualification is very, very important. Unfortunately, bulk of the surgeons are passing out and getting out into private practice. If they want to become good endoscopic surgeons, if they, even if they want to become good microsurgeons or neurosurgeons, these I, I came out in private practice after almost six years after qualifying as a neurosurgeon. Seventh year, I came into private practice. So you have to spend an extended period of time. Personally, I feel anybody who doesn't have hemibalismus or chorea or is not an alcoholic can do any operation. If he can do it, why can I not do it? It's just a matter of opportunity, training, and anatomy. Now, you have to get that opportunity or you have to go to that place where such opportunities are present and postpone your getting into private practice. You cannot start learning when you're in private practice. You, the amount of things that you can learn. See, I always give the example of the bicycle. All of you must have learned the bicycle. And where did you learn the bicycle? I learned the bicycle when, you know, in our time, there was this bicycle available for 30 paise an hour. These are old bicycles where you went to the village and took your uncle's bicycle and you drop there. Somebody used to run behind you holding the seat, some elder cousin. And uh, the trick of the bicycle learning was not the pedaling, was not sitting on the seat, not knowing where are the brakes, but developing the balance. And nobody could teach you the balance. The balance came from inside. You picked up, one day you learned the balance and then you find somebody was not holding the seat and you were very thrilled only to fall down. And then you hurt your knees, you had to fall many times till you learned the bicycle. Spinal surgery, neurosurgery, or any surgeries like this, you must be in a place where you have old bicycles. I'm not saying that you experiment on people, but in public hospitals, definitely the opportunities are more where you should learn on these bicycles. And then here, nobody's going to give you a brand new Atlas or a brand new, I don't know what are the new bicycles called, worth 40,000, 50,000, take and learn bicycles. You cannot. You would be sued. You'll end up in trouble. So if you want to become do or promote, then you have to focus yourself on that type of surgery. You have to focus and keep on doing the same operation again and again to become better and better at it. That choice you have to make, that decision you have to make. People like me, we are not beyond that. We are doing, I'm a neurosurgeon. My first choice, of course, is brain surgery. Spine surgery is one of the products of, one of the aspects of being a neurosurgeon. But if somebody wants to focus on something and become good like Pramod Lokande, then he should be doing only that operation. That era has come. Now there are too many people. So you cannot just say that, you know, I'm an endoscopic spine surgeon because I finished my training, did two workshops, did one category question when I'm into endoscopic spine surgery. No, 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 that is not correct because you have to, the disasters of a very simple thing like lumbar disc can be life-threatening. For example, that case with Ajoy showed, a simple discectomy went on to get infected with that big scar, then fixation, then fusion, because this is not, you know, nail bed abscess drainage. Everything can go right 99% of the time, but if one patient goes bad, that guy is going to hang like an albatross in your neck. And therefore, before you attend these things, see, micro lumbar, I don't think that there's a good chance that you know, everything is going to be all right. Very small chance things are going to go wrong. But if something goes wrong, it can be miserable. So you, I feel that the correct message should be, yes, of course, I'm not against development and newer technology. I stay one kilometer from the hospital. And I used to drive my, my, my BMW. I wanted a BMW X5. My wife tells me that you're, you're going to drive for one and a half kilometers. Why do you want the X5? I have no explanation. So I canceled buying the X5. So you should know what you need and what you're going to use. There's no point in just getting fascinated, you know, by birds in the sky, which are flying very high. I always tell the story of Icarus. Icarus learned to fly and then he taught his son to fly by putting wax on his and putting the feathers of bird. He told his son, don't get attracted to birds in the sky. They are natural flyers like Lokande, like Vishal Pashati, where you'll go higher and higher, the sun will melt the wax and will fall down and die. So be equanimous in your thinking. 
know what your limitations are and what your training is of course there is no limit to training learn every day i still feel that in we always we should remain a student and continue training till the last day of our life thank you very much shailesh i think we have the young man who is still going to contribute yeah so i think uh, the indications the training all these things we have learned and heard from the stalwarts they all were excellent there is a specific indication for each Uh, Dr. Lo uh, Pramod Lokhande, Dr. Uh, uh, Vishal Peshetiwar, and Dr. Patkar were brilliant in uh, explanation. It does not mean that uh, they are doing only one type of surgery. They do all gamut of spine surgery, and this is just a healthy debate for learning for youngsters. We would like to hear the man who was not confused. Dr. Ajoy was confused, and Dr. Himanshu is not confused. So let's see what Himanshu has to say. Over to you, Dr. Himanshu. Thank you, sir. i just start sharing my screen actually dr ram sir has moderated the session so well and the discussion has been so extremely healthy so actually i have no job left because everything has been crystal clear to the listeners so after this healthy discussion and such great debates my actually actually my job is very boring it is like a job guy who is doing post match analysis after very interesting matches which we have seen right now but again as i always say a match is never complete or a broadcast is never complete about without the analysis after the match so i have to go through with it so starting with first debate it a shakespeare and debate uh, whether to fuse or not to fuse or the fuse to replace or to replace so all this debate about cervical fusion is about one question which has been repeatedly been there uh, throughout this webinar ki where do we stand today so about acdf and uh, cervical disc replacement the question is have fancier gadgets made acdf outdated so acdf has always been a gold standard because it has reliable outcome easy approach uh, most common procedure which is with uh, it's a very common procedure so the fellows or the upcoming surgeons are very well trained in that and obviously the low complication rate so by the end of the last millennium or the by the end of the 90s acdf was the undisputed king of anterior cervical surgeries whenever it was a disc surgery it was the acdf which was a uh, option of choice so it was the king there was no doubt about it but at the turn of the millennium in the early 2000s there was a challenger or the heir apparent to the king so it was the rise of cervical disc replacement was it really the check to the king so i am mostly going to talk about the literature so make to make the boring literature a little interesting i have made this so rise of cervical disc replacement was it really a check to the king so in early 2000s or in mid 2000s as it has been previously said there was a huge excitement about cervical disc replacements so the whole notion was about preserving the motion so it was just preserve the motion because it is going to be useful for the future so there has been a lot of literature about that in 2000s uh, it was initial paper by philip zetal who said and cdr is an innovative technology that preserves motion at the instrumented levels and it will potentially improve the load transfer at the adjacent segments and it will decrease the adjacent segment disease another paper by by rudolf etal about the early results they said that analysis involving pro disc c arthroplasty indicate the significant improvement in pain and functional outcome there was no spontaneous fusion at the level of surgery or at the adjacent level which was noted another paper by pulit zetal they said it is essentially a ball and socket joint like a hip but in a small function so it doesn't affect the motion it actually pre preserves the motion at this level and since it is preserving at the motion at the level it is not going to cause any adjacent segment degeneration when troubles come to you they come in from all directions so there were a lot of papers in that era in that decade about other weaknesses of anterior cervical spine fusion surgeries so these were about the complications of the plate so this was another weakness that was exposed uh, in a paper by yi yang et al they said that comparing acdf with a plate cdr with a prestige lp can significantly reduce both transience and persistent post operative dysphagia as you can see plates have some profile those are going to lie anterior to your vertebral bodies the disc just slipped inside the vertebral body so it had zero profile so anterior cervical plating were associated with higher incidence of dysphagia due to its high profile that's what they said another paper stating the same by z ning uh, bio biomechanical complications such as loose implant cage slipping these are worrisome with the plate need of multiple anchorages makes the procedure prone to the errors dysphagia and implant related complications may be disastrous due to its thick profile 
So by the end of first decade of the millennium, it looked like the challenger has already overtaken the king, and it might dethrone the king and become a new king of the cervical spine surgeries. But then came the next decade, that 2010s, where the king actually bounced back. Uh, once the initial enthusiasm about the cervical disc replacements came down a little, it was because of the long-term surgery, long-term uh, evidences of seven years and eight years and ten years publications uh, started pouring out. So it was a first uh, Dr. Patkar sir. Actually, uh, Dr. Patkar sir just mentioned about him. So ACDF is uh, Dr. Findlay. They actually said that ACDF is as effective as TDR. This replacement reduces the risk of adjacent dis disease. Uh, but continued uncertainty remains about the degeneration of the prosthesis and it needs a long term surveillance we don't know what is going to happen to that disc in next 15 years 20 years and 25 years so until we get that data you cannot be very happy that it has absolutely replaced the acdf another paper by nindyala et al they said both cohorts that is acdf and the cervical disc replacement demonstrated comparable incidences of early post operative complications and costs there were no significant difference in the risk of comp uh, post operative complication there was no significant difference between the functional outcomes in long term another paper by kureshi et al they said both scdf and cdr were shown to be cost effective procedure in their reference cases in their respective cases the results indicated that the cdr must remain functional at least for 14 years to establish a greater cost effectiveness uh, effectiveness than acdf so if you have to pay that much of money it has to stay functional at least for 14 years if you, it has to be as cost effective as acdf is so since king was reinventing itself it was developing itself into a better king he actually uh, rectified another weakness which was pointed out earlier in the earlier decade so it was because of the invention of integrated screw with keys and spacer system so this was again a paper by Baz et al. They said that it provided the biomechanical stability and fusion rates with excellent outcomes with one or two level ACDFs. The advantages include low rates of dysphagia, decreased operative time, because again, this is a low profile implant as compared to plates. So that was the weakness with the ACDF. It was rectified with these kind of low profile implants. Another paper, this is a paper from India, Sir Gangaram Hospital. These low-profile cage, uh, cage screw implants, it has, an, uh, it has an advantage of lesser tissue dissection, low rates of dysphagia, low subsidence rate with good maintenance of cervical lordosis without compromising its bony fusion. So this was the decade where the king actually got himself back in the game. So now, today, what is the condition? Now, today is the condition where the king leads its way with its heir apparent. So the king is still the king. It is reinventing itself. The implants are getting better. The fusion techniques are getting better. BMP is there. A lot of biomechanical studies are happening with the implants. So ACDF is progressing in, in its own way. And again, the CDR has proved that it is beneficial. It is still waiting for very long-term procedure. So the CDR is here to stay. The king is here. The heir apparent is here. So what do we do? So we we should go with this king or that king. We should go for ACDF or we should go with cervical disc replacement. So what we have to do is we have to choose our own king according to what kingdoms we practice in. So the area you practice, the patients you get, the patients' demands, you have to choose your own king according to the kingdom where you practice. So this is probably the take-home message everybody has already stressed enough about. So coming to the next debate, uh, how to decompress it, a lumbar disc, microtubular, micro, micro lumbar decompression or through tubes or through endoscope. So these are the techniques which have over, evolved over a time. So first was probably the micro lumbar decompression, then the tubes evolved, then the endoscope came. So microtubular discectomy, it's like Sunil Gavaskar to Indian cricket. So it started, it was evolved. Uh, in a time where spine surgery didn't have a great name. In the 70s and 80s, it was one good thing about spine surgery, which was giving good consistent results, solid results with good functional outcomes. So it was to spine surgery what Sunil Kawaskar was to Indian team or Indian batting. It gave its recognition or a good name. Solid performance, consistent performance. So to talk about microlumbar discectomy, actually this part, Dr. Patkar sir has left nothing to say for me. He has covered uh, the literature extensively, but I'll just go forward fast. 
so uh, one of the first few papers in 70s williams et al they said it satisfactory results were achieved in 94% of patients after one procedure patient remain economically and product economically productive and physically comfortable at the time of one year, one year follow up another paper by herard et al they said excellent results were obtained in more than 90% of patients and morbidity was negligible post operative pain was minimal and they said that they discharged the patient within 2 days after micro lumbar discectomy then the time evolved then came a next pro procedure so it was like sachin to indian batting so it made the game popularize more it was accepted by the next generation the next generation fell in love with that the love was very widespread because now for a spine fellow when he comes out of teaching institute MIS or tubular discectomies have become routine. You have to know that because almost all centers, almost all spine surgeons are actually doing it. So all so for a generation after the previous generation, everybody's favorite was tubular discectomy. So it gained widespread pop, uh, love from all the spine surgeons across the world. Uh, so to praise that technique, actually, it was one of the papers by Bernard et al. They said microendoscopic line laminectomy can be used. to decompress the spinal canal and fragmentectomy as effectively as mld it may be beneficial in decreasing the complications and it gives excellent post operative symptomatic relief another paper by oya et al they said the microendoscopic technique was associated with lower risk of ssi and major complications following the discectomy the rate of incision in infection was very low it was already mentioned in the paper by dr arvind kulkarni in previous topic uh, the previous speakers so excellent out, uh, post operative outcome was seen with tubular decompression then came the next generation next generation was in love with the next uh, fancy gadget or the next thing which was like virat kohli to indian batting it was flamboyant it was flashy it was stylish just like the incision which is there on the body dusre din pe patient bhi dhoonta dhoonta are sala incision ki idhar surgery hua ki nahi small incision cosmetic incision very good looking surgery fancy gadgets but not only fancy and good looking it is effective it is solid it is reproduce with one with reproducible results and good and persistent outcome so again uh, lee et al they said the clinical outcomes of percutaneous lumbar endoscopic discectomy cases are superior for blood loss operative time hospital stay obviously that is less good results are reproducible which is the most important thing and the patient can get back to its normal daily activities in shortest possible time another paper by takuni et al they said 93% of the patient had excellent outcomes with transforaminal percutaneous endoscopic discectomy also the complications which is 5.5% and the recurrence rate is 4.1% can be considered within the standard results of uh, micro lumbar discectomy and tubular discectomy now who's better is gavaskar better is sachin better or who's who's better amongst these three so it is a ongoing debate so the literature is a harsha bogle to you harsha bogle always says when it comes to comparison between the, these three batting greats that you don't compare them these three are great in their own manner so when we start comparing per percutaneous lumbar endoscopic discectomy with mld it shows that the clinical reasons of pled are similar to those of micro lumbar discectomy in regard to improvement in radiation of pain and disability endoscopic discectomy is safe and effective technique representing an alternative to gold standard of micro lumbar discectomy but not a substitution it's just an alternative you can do either this or that it's your choice another paper when it compares micro endoscopic discectomy with micro lumbar discectomy long term functional and clinical outcomes did not differ between patients allocated to tubular discectomy and conventional micro discectomy primary and secondary outcomes measures did not support the hypothesis advantage of tubular discectomy over conventional micro discectomy so the outcomes were absolutely same the third comparison between other two players is med versus pled although pled ha had the advantage of quicker po quicker post operative recovery and more immediate effect the clinical outcomes of both surgical techniques were absolutely similar so again the thing micro discectomy or mis or that is the tubular decompression or endoscopy these are legend these are tried and tested and proven surgical methods so these surgical methods have proved themselves they are reproducible they are solid they give consistent results so 
the surgeons who just spoke about it they debated about it these are the champions of their field these are the champions in this field of spine surgery they make all these things look very easy when dr lokhande is doing a endoscopy you feel it's very easy i can do i can go home tomorrow and do it when i have seen countless time uh, uh, i have seen dr patkar uh, operate countless times during my fellowship when he does a surgery you feel it is very easy i can go home tomorrow and do it but it is not the case because you are not these guys so if these three are these champions so what are we so we have to choose very wisely and we have to do what is best in our hands so what you uh, you always have to talk to your patient you have to understand your patient and you have to do what is best in your setup in your skill set and according to your training so i think that probably sums it up yeah shall i stop sharing yeah yeah i think uh, you are you are the true winner himanchu you summed up so well actually you are taking the trophy of all <laughs> <laughs> yes ram sir thank you very much i would like to thank all the esteemed faculty i would like to thank professor ajit shinde president moa professor narayan karne secretary moa and president pos and all my dear friends ortho tv for having made this all possible sanchet institute for having got everybody together and taking off just to make a final comment whether it is gavaskar in tests whether it is sachin tendulkar in one day international whether it is virat kohli in t20 if you want to do something try and emulate mr 360 which is ab de villiers who has everything in his army materium but he decides when he will reverse sweep when he will play along the ground and when he will lock it for a six you cannot be a brilliant cricketer only by reverse sweeping only by lifting for sixes or only by playing along the ground so be like him train yourself so that you will have horses for courses and you will be a horse that can run all courses all the best god bless you have a great time thank you very much thank you ram i was very impressed with the last speaker i think uh, he is the uh, you know the new kid on the block so in the years to come we need speakers and people like him i was really impressed with him thank you sir thank you all the viewers for giving us this time on the weekend and uh, all the faculty the stellar faculty we, we had today for giving their inputs uh, and a long way to go next uh, next saturday is our last weekend for the spine connect and we have a very good uh, faculty there and then we'll be taking off for some time uh, stay safe stay healthy thank you pos thank you maharashtra orthopedic association and thank you sanjiti hospital for this wonderful spine connect thank you all Thank you friends bye 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 thank you good night